All right, it says we're live here. If so, hello everybody, I'm Robert Breaker and we're back. And uh, yes, we are live, so let me click on that so I can uh, see you guys on chat. <laughs> if you can hear me, let me know. Uh, let everybody on, on there with us, let us know. I now have the chat, all right, so I can chat with me. All right, so I've got an eye on the chat, if you're here with us, so please go to the chat. Um, today I'm doing a live stream. I've done um, a lot of interviews lately. I've done one with um, Roy Bell here a couple of weeks ago, maybe you remember. And uh, then I did a uh, live stream with, um, well, actually it wasn't a live stream. I did a interview with a giant <laughs> and uh, his name was John Dislin. I just posted that today. And so also uh, I wanted to do another one and I thought I'd do an interview with a friend today that I, uh, have as, as a friend of mine because of his love for the Bible. And I tell you, it's getting harder and harder and harder to find people that love the Bible and know the Bible and, and want to fellowship and have your basis of fellowship be around the Word of God. And so it's getting harder and harder. So that's what I'm trying to bring to you all that watch me, good brothers and sisters in Christ. And I try to do that. Remember our live stream a while back with uh, Sister Lisa, Lisa Boyce. We've done two already. And uh, so I try to find good folks, but it's hard. It's hard to find good folks nowadays. We are indeed in a time of apostasy. So before I introduce my special guest with you, I'd like to read some verses. And uh, if you all can hear me, let me know. Just say we can hear you, Brother Breaker. Um, make sure I, I get that confirmation because otherwise you're just seeing my mouth move. But if you can hear me, um, it'd be great. Let's uh, see if I can share real quick with you all the... Um, some scripture well, and before we get started with our new guest. And again, if you can hear me, let me know. Let me know. So we're going to share uh, scripture here today. And I want to start in Proverbs 27. How it got to Proverbs 29, I don't know, but I know we're going to probably end on this verse. So we're, we're in Proverbs chapter 27 and uh, verse, Proverbs 27, verse 17. And excuse me, I've been out all weekend cutting down trees and working and I'm just tired my voice is going too. Proverbs 27 17 iron sharpeneth iron so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Amen and that's what we should do we should try to sharpen one another and uh, sharp you know sometimes when a person is not too smart they say he's not too sharp is he? So the more we learn the word of God the more we give that to others and they're learning the word of God and they give it back to us we, we're literally sharpening, sharpening each other. And that's a good thing. And it, and it says in Proverbs 27, 19, as in water, face answereth, answereth, see, I can barely talk, face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. So it's important that we remember that, and we should always try to find others like ourselves, like-minded, and who believe like we do, but also know what we know. And I enjoy teaching and preaching, and I love edifying, and that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, the Bible says in Colossians 4, 4, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. There's a way that we ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them with, that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And that's what studying the Bible is all about and why it's so important. is We, want, we ought to know how to answer someone from the Bible. And that's something I've always wanted to do. I wanted to be sure that I'm able to say, well, let me show you that in the Bible. <laughs> um, because, you know, I'm not really interested in giving my opinion. And uh, so what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about a lot of things. And um, we're going to talk about uh, probably a little bit of tradition. And uh, the guy that I've got here with me today that I'm going to bring on, he is like me in a lot of ways. That's one of the reasons why I like him. He's been where I've been and he's seen what I've seen. And a lot of times when you're inside of a group, you tend to not see certain things. You tend to oversee certain things or overlook, excuse me, overlook certain things. It's when you get away from and you're looking from the outside in that you really see just how bad things are nowadays. And so I've got a friend today named Fabriel Ochiusi, and I'm going to bring him on now. Fabriel, if you would uh, unmute and say hello to everybody. Hello. How's everyone doing? All right. I hope they can see you here. I'm still yeah. trying to figure this all out. And Fabriel's a young man, and he lives down in uh, South Florida. And uh, we've got together before and had lunch together and talked, and we've been talking ever since. 
and he really loves the Word of God. He really loves the Bible. And so, Fabrielle, boy, it's really slow on YouTube, so I guess I won't be looking back at YouTube, but there you are. Okay, you're coming on. I guess it's going back and forth like it did with Roy when we're talking, so i got to be careful not to talk over you so that you come up. But I want to introduce everybody to Fabrielle, and as you notice in the background, he likes um, the man who I went to his Bible school. (laughs) And so those are drawings from from his school, and he was a great artist. Uh, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman is where I went to Bible school. And uh, so, Fabrielle, introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. Yeah, my name is uh, Fabrielle Acutzi. Uh, I uh, live in Orlando, Florida. I am a Bible believer by many people. Um, I was born in Hialeah, Florida, and came and moved here to Orlando. And I'm currently right now serving in a Bible-believing church in Orlando. And and yeah, just God has been good. He's opened many doors for me to go out and street preach. And now have a YouTube channel as well to upload Bible studies and edify other people. So yeah, God has been good. Amen. So Fabriel came down and visited and you're coming back again too pretty soon. And we're going to yeah. get together again. And uh, Fabriel has been through a lot in his life. And he has, as the Bible said, studied. And that's one of the things that impressed me is how many different cults you've been in. <laughs> in the sense that you you went looking for everything, but you yeah. didn't just hook, line, and sink or follow everything people say. You no. went to the Bible and say, okay, you say this is the way it is. Now does the Bible say that? Yeah. And that uh, got you out of Catholicism. That got you out of Calvinism. That got you out of, go ahead, I'll, I'll let you talk, but it's interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I used to be a Catholic. I was raised Catholic, baptized Catholic, went to communion, and was even a confirmed Catholic. All right, a confirmed Catholic is basically uh, when you reach of age where you are legitimately confirmed as a Catholic. They give you a little name. You're supposed to have a little name uh, as a saint. Mine was Saint Michael. You know, Saint Michael the Archangel. They let me do that. You know, <laughs> when I was a kid. So yeah, I went through all of that. I studied uh, the Catechism. I studied the the Church Fathers. I studied, you know, went to see what they believed in, and they all, all of them contradicted each other, and it was just a huge mess, and, and, and I started, you know, reading my Bible a lot, and, you know, the Lord showed me some things in the Word that contradicted the Catholic Church in major areas, and I'm like, wow, I can't believe this is happening, so I just ended up leaving, and became a Lutheran <laughs> after I became a Lutheran, I was like, well, there's some things wrong here, and then after that, I left and became Reformed. <laughs> was reformed calvinist for a while had to because you can't there's some stuff in there where you gotta if you don't rightly divide you're gonna get messed up basically and that's not what i was doing i wasn't rightly dividing then after that uh, i ended up becoming a bible believer so yeah that's been my journey and ended up getting saved when i was a when i was a calvinist i ended up getting saved because my whole struggle was Am I predestined to be saved? If not, you know, because the main teachers of the day, you know, like Paul Washer and John MacArthur, they're like, well, if you, how we can tell you're saved is if you endure unto the end. So, (laughs) which is the letter P in perseverance. So I was like, am I enduring to the end? Am I doing good enough? You know? (laughs) So I was very confused, huge, huge confusion. But dispensationalism pretty much uh, solved everything. It brought everything to light. It made the scripture clear. So, yeah, that's pretty much my my little journey there. Amen. Amen. So tell us then, how did you get saved? I want to hear about that. And uh, how on earth did you find me? <laughs> so uh, let's see. Are you seeing me right now? Because it's going back and forth, just like it did when we had Roy on. I don't know how we can both be on at the same time. I've tried so hard. So go ahead. Tell us about how you got saved. All right. So I got saved around 2016. Um, I was, you know, Calvinist and I was I was like so focused on enduring to the end and and I realized that I was a sinner. I already knew that I was going to hell because I was thinking to myself, man, you know, I'm not good enough to be elect or, you know, I'm hoping that God chose me. And if God did cho- choose me, how do I know that I'm truly saved? And of course, the letter P comes in, in, uh, in perseverance of the saints. So, yeah. And, you know, I was just so asphyxiated, so focused on that, that, that I just came down and I said, Lord, you know, you just got to show me, you got to show me what to do. You know, I, I need help. And I confess it to the Lord. And, and I went, you know, when my Bible opened, I went on YouTube. And the first video I sort of encountered was Dr. Ruckman. And he has a video on disproving Calvinism. Because <laughs> my whole asphyxiation on proving it was, you know, Pharaoh, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh couldn't do nothing about it, you know. And he sort of went through the scripture on that. And, 
and so forth. And he, he showed a lot of scrub stuff in the scripture that most Calvinists will not take you to. So they'll take you to certain portions, but they won't show you the rest. So I'm like, wow, that really opened my mind up. So, and not only that, but um, I encountered other Bible believers like Gene Kim and of course you, Brother Breaker, and and you preach the blood. Obviously, you have messages and messages of videos of videos uh, on you preaching the blood. And basically, I, I ended up getting saved. I ended up trusting what the Lord Jesus Christ did for me in the cross of Calvary. Then I knew from then on, I knew. I knew and I, I knew from then on I was saved and saved forever just by reading the Bible, studying the Bible and just trusting in the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, first of all, what is a good verse for a Calvinist to show that Calvinism is not biblical? What What's probably the best verse that undoes Calvinism? Well, they got, as you know, they got, you know, about tulip. There's five points uh, total, total depravity, unconditional election. Uh, uh, limited atonement irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints so one good verse that dismounts all of that they believe in limited atonement that jesus christ did not die for everyone but he only died for the elect there's a verse in first john if i remember correctly i, I don't have it on the top of my head where it says uh, jesus christ uh, died not for our sins only but also for the sins of the whole world right and one thing that they used to disprove that is that they like to run to the greek a lot like for example john three sixteen, you know if you if you try to mention john three sixteen to a calvinist you'll run to the greek and mess you up with the greek right because they don't believe in a final authority they are the final authority when you run to a calvinist and you look at their you look at their debates whenever they do a debate they have to jump from one translation to another translation to another translation to another translation always always so when I used to look at uh, James White, James White would, would put up any translation he wanted and they would all say different things. And I used to look, uh, listen to James White, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. The only thing uh, now when it comes to predestination, I do believe in predestination, but in the context of Romans 8 is predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, not to be saved. <laughs> That's the right. thing to choose to be saved. Once you're saved from then on, you're predestined. It's like a roller coaster. Once you get in a roller coaster and you hear the bars click chick, 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 from then on, everything else is predestined. Because you're going to his image. Amen. Exactly, exactly. So there are many cults out there, and there are a lot of cults that are started by tradition. And what they do is they go and they teach tradition and what man teaches over what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And that's why, why oftentimes they tell people don't read the Bible. Because yes. if you do, then you would get out of them. And that's why I'm not a Roman Catholic. That's why you're not a Roman yeah. Catholic. Amen. Um, the Pope called our King James Bible, the Pope called it the paper Pope. Mm -hmm. And there were many different decrees throughout the history of the Catholic Church in which they said the common man is not supposed to read the Bible. Oh, yeah. And many people don't believe that. But that's true history. And, and I mean, the Council of Trent, the Council of, uh, there were a lot of them. And as a matter of fact, the, the Spanish Bible, he put that in the front of his Bible, kind of like in your face. Hey, Pope, you say we can't read it. Well, I translate it so that the Spanish people can read it. So there were many Christians that wanted to read the Bible, but they were told by the religion or the cult they were in that they shouldn't. But if you read the Bible, you'll get the truth because the Bible is the truth. And uh, Calvinism, I believe, is a cult. Yeah. And it's uh, much tradition. It's following Calvin, a man, rather than following the word of God. It's what he says the Bible says. <laughs> should we go by what some guy says that the Bible says, or should we just go to the source, the Bible, and Amen. forget about what he says, because who cares? And so uh, that's what I want to do. So I wanted to, to start out today because we're seeing in these last days of apostasy and falling away from truth, yep. many people turning from truth to tradition. And I thought I'd read some verses on that because... Um, you even see it. You went to a Bible school that you had to leave <laughs> yeah. because you wanted to go to Bible school and you went to one and you found out very quickly, man, these guys don't know much Bible. Amen. They were right. so rooted in a certain tradition that they would at all costs defend the tradition and like they're throwing the Bible out. No, I'm going to throw out the tradition and keep the Bible. Amen. That's what you're supposed to do. So let's look at that and uh, let's go to. Um, some scriptures. So let me pull up the, the Bible here again, and we'll start in Mark chapter 7. 
And when Jesus showed up, he showed up to the Pharisees. And Jesus shows up to the Pharisees, and he was very angry with them. Why? Because they were the religious leaders who were supposed to be following the Bible. Amen. And what they had done is they set up their own tradition that they followed instead. And that's what made Jesus so mad. They were lost religious people teaching man-made doctrine rather than Bible. And in March, uh, Mark 7, 6, he answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah, now that's Isaiah, yeah. prophesied of you, hypocrites. <laughs> Jesus says they're all a bunch of hypocrites. As it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They tried to put, pass themselves off as we're true Bible believers. And yet they were so full of tradition that they weren't even following the Bible. So they were pretending to be something they were not. That's what a hypocrite is. Yeah. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, doctrine matters, doesn't it? I mean, we did a, a live stream with uh, Spencer Smith, and that's his famous saying, doctrine matters. Well, which doctrine? Bible doctrine. Because there is a man doctrine. Yeah. And there's a lot of churches all over America and all over the world that are teaching doctrine of men instead of doctrine of God and the Bible. And here's an example. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and, and many other such like things do ye. And Jesus is just giving them an, an example of here's something that you guys do that's not in the Bible. Well, there's nothing wrong with washing your cups and cleaning your dishes and things like that, but they're making that what we say to do it. Well, how about... Let's do what God says to do. And he said to them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. And that's what a lot of people do in this world. They belong to a cult that teaches man-made tradition. And in order to follow that man-made tradition, they reject the commandment of God. They reject the Bible. And I don't think they see that they're doing that, but they do. They do that. Now go down a little bit further to Mark 7.13 making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, yeah. which we have delivered, and many such things like things do ye. The word of God effectually worketh also in you that believe, we're told in Thessalonians. The word of God is sharp and quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the word of God works, but whenever man's tradition takes over, that makes the word of God of none effect because you're ultimately believing in what man said rather than God said. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Now, in the Bible, there is good tradition and there's bad tradition. Let's go to Colossians here. And let me show you that because um, tradition in and of itself isn't bad as long as it is Bible based. But when it's outside the Bible and it's tradition of following men, that's when we're messed up. That's when it's wrong. Colossians 2.8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Well, philosophy, I'm not a philosopher. I, I don't believe in philosophy in the sense that uh, I don't follow the, the pagan philosophy of Socrates and Aristotle and all those men who were uh, self-righteous and prideful and worldly, and they had their own worldly wisdom and not godly wisdom. They denied God. But it says, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So there is a false tradition, a bad tradition. Here's another one. This has to do with salvation. Yeah. Peter says in 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Wow. So the Jews believed in their father's tradition, hey, through silver and gold, we can obtain redemption. We can get forgiveness if you pay for it. <laughs> That's no, no. Jesus had to pay for it. You can't buy your way into heaven. So what do we do? Well, it's but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. It's what Jesus did that saves us, not what you do or what you pay. So there are some false traditions in the Bible, but then there are some good ones. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. And I'm, I assume you can still see this up there. Yeah. Um, for everyone. Now we command you, brother, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would draw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Well, who is us? Paul and the early apostles. Yeah. So that tradition in Scripture that they set up is the true tradition. And Amen. it is in Scripture. So any denomination that says they're of God, but they're man-made traditions, and it's not tradition of Bible, the 66 books that we have, they are not of God. 
And what are we supposed to do? Withdraw ourselves. We're supposed to get away from cults. We're supposed to get away from false brethren. We're supposed to get away from tradition that is outside of the Bible. Amen. And uh, that's what the Bible teaches. So let me stop sharing there. And so with that stated, uh, a lot of people in the world today, they are religious, but they're lost. And there's a lot of religious people out there following religion. What is the difference between religion and salvation? Well, religion is man-made. And religion is a system of works that man says, well, if you do it this way, then you just might go to heaven when you die. Maybe. <laughs> and that offers no hope whatsoever because you can never know if you're saved or not because you never know if you did enough. Yeah. That is not salvation. Yet, yeah. Isn't that Catholicism? <laughs> yeah. T- isn't that Calvinism? To a T. Go ahead. They care. They, uh, in order for, for them to establish a final authority, the Pope is the final authority, but they say they have to meet uh, Scripture with the tradition, and the tradition always overrules Scripture. All right, so they view the the Scripture in the lenses of the tradition. All right, so basically, um, and I like to use this phrase here. You know, Catholics use uh, catechisms, and catechisms are are basically is a, is a word for teaching. And the Catholic, uh, the Catholic Church uses that to teach, you know, the laity teach people. I like to say that uh, that the Pauline epistles from Romans to Philemon, I like to say that uh, that the Pauline epistles is like a catechism. Oh, you cut out there, I guess. Yes. Okay, I'm back. I, I accidentally closed the whole thing, and I was gone from the whole meeting. Now I'm back. So, okay, go ahead. All right. So, basically, uh, Romans to Philemon is like a catechism. Paul pretty much explains it to you how the Christian life should be lived, right? Now, the Catholic Church, they invent their own catechisms. So, what they'll do is that they'll interpret Scripture with the tradition, with the catechism. But how we as Bible believers should interpret Scripture is how Paul interpreted or how Paul said it. Because the Bible says that Paul, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Right. We should be uh, we should be uh, students of the Bible. We should. Uh, the Bible says that Paul is a pattern. He's a pattern of long suffering to to everyone that should believe. So he is that pattern, you know. So while we're following Christ, yes, we're following Christ. I'm not saying that we're not following Christ. We're following Christ, but we're following Christ through the lenses of Paul. But once the Catholic Church came in, they're all faith and works. That's the exact uh, opposite message of Paul. <laughs> Paul, Romans 4, you'll read, Romans 4, 5, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So that's a huge difference to what the Catholic Church teaches. And of course, they, in order for them to prove their stances, they got to run to tribulation epistles. And they got to run to the ministry of Jesus Christ, which are two different things. Uh, uh, the, the, I think Gene Kim worded it, worded it like this, a different group of people in different time period. So, yeah. Amen, amen. Um, so... Religion is a system of works that man says you have to do in order to justify yourself before God. But that's not what saves you. Salvation is what you receive when you come to Jesus as a sinner and trust his blood atonement on your behalf, what he did for you. And you trust that for salvation. And then he saves you. And guess what? Then you know you're saved. Then you don't live in fear. Well, I hope I did enough. No, Jesus did enough. If I doubt that, then I'm saying I'm doubting if Jesus did enough. Now, I can't doubt it because he did everything. He paid everything. Amen. So we're living in a day and age of, of um, apostasy and falling away from truth. And truly, apostasy has been throughout the whole church age. It's just yeah. getting worse toward the end. But that's why there's something like 6,000 different denominations out there that claim to be Christians. <laughs> and uh, it's because they all have false doctrine. And you had a good point there. Go ahead and, and uh, talk a little bit more. I'm going to get a book out. I want to show you real quick. So. Yeah. So what you're saying is absolutely correct. A lot of people, you know, get messed up with tradition and and usually has to do with emotion, because the one who teaches you the tradition is usually your father and your mother. And obviously your father and your mother love you very much, you know, and, and, you know, you will obviously love your mother and your father very much. So it has to do with emotion and love. And that's sadly how the devil has seeped through the cracks because the devil uses love, too. He does. In fact, I'm highly convinced in the tribulation time period, the reason why uh, most people won't 
won't uh won't refuse the mark and they'll take the mark and they'll blaspheme god with an open fist is because some of their family members died in one of the seals <laughs> you know so maybe that's why the that's why they'll they'll reject christ so it has to do with with emotion and that's mainly what the devil seeps through the cracks in and you can see the same thing you know with pentecostalism with pentecostals because pentecostals are uh, are very emotional people I've talked to some of them, and man, it's all emotions with them. You can't go Baba with them because once you go Baba with them, they start going in tears. Either they start going in tears or they start crying or they get mad. And it's something really sad. It's not nothing because imagine being in a state of fear and a spirit of fear where you're always like, you know, like always looking around thinking, well, what, what bad can happen to you? Oh, you lost your salvation for the 50th time, you know? <laughs> and I was sort of like that for a long time. I was like that. So I'm, I'm thankful that I got saved. So, yeah. Amen. Amen. So, yeah. All right. Finally, found my books. I want to bring some books out to you and show you. Um, so here's the problem with the world today is they're following tradition. And like you said earlier, it basically boils down to they don't understand Paul. Yeah. Paul's ministry and Jesus's ministry. Jesus's ministry was for Jews. Amen. So everything he says, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's literally saying to them. Now, some of it is spiritually applied to us today. Amen. because. He alludes to some things that are going to come because he knew that he would be rejected. But most of your so-called modern Christianity, they go to the teachings of Jesus and they try to only go there and leave Paul out. Yeah. And you can't do that because Paul is the one that God called to give more information, more revelation. And the heart of New Testament doctrine is Paul's epistles. And what I've seen, I got this book years ago, True Christianity by Joan Arndt. Okay, hmm. this is back in the... Was this written in the 16 or 1700s? And this was a Protestant. And I read his book of what he called true Christianity. And it was the four volumes. <laughs> this would be like the Institutes of Calvin, you know. Yeah. But this was by Johann Arndt. And this was all about what we as Protestants believe. And it's just so blatantly in your face. It's we take Paul and we take Jesus. And we try to reconcile. Well, they don't always reconcile. So they're always saying one thing out of the side of their mouth and another thing out of the other side of their mouth. They don't understand. So they don't rightly divide. So what a sad, sad thing that so many claim to be Christians and they didn't rightly divide. Like John Calvin. John Calvin murdered people. Yeah. You know, he was trying to get them back under the Old Testament law. Uh, we have today, we have uh, so-called Baptists <laughs> that uh, don't understand the tradition of many baptists yeah a lot of baptists had false doctrine and, and bad traditions not all but a lot of them this is called old landmarkism by jr graves and uh, many of your landmark baptist people they they go back to this and they say we're baptist we're baptist hard, hard uh, you know hardline baptist like this guy when you start reading this man he didn't understand the body of christ yeah no, right. he said you use liquor in yeah. the lord's supper Fermented liquor in the Lord's Supper. So a lot of people don't realize that we can't go with tradition. We got to go with the Bible. You got many modern day Baptists today going around saying, oh, no, there's no rapture. There's no rapture. That started with a man named Darby in the 1800s and some yeah. woman. And it's like, um, excuse me, silly. Amen. Have you ever read the book Dispensationalism Before Darby? Amen. Um, yes, no. they've always taught dispensations. And yes, there have been people that believed in the rapture before Darby. I just cannot believe the absolute lies coming out of the mouth of people that claim to be Christians. And one of the things a Christian is supposed to do is tell the truth and not lie. Yeah. But I would get it over and over and over. Oh, Breaker's a liar. There's no rapture. That started with a guy named Darby. And dispensationalisms, that's not in the Bible. Except for the fact the word's found four times, right? Yeah. And I don't need to go there. We talked about this with Roy yeah. when he was on. We're dispensationalists because there are dispensations. And this is a great book, Dispensationalism Before Darby, that literally shuts the mouth of these liars. And uh, we are, I guess you would say, independent Baptists. At least I'm ordained independent Baptist. But you got to watch out because even with that crowd, we're seeing an apostasy or, or falling away with what they call the new independent fundamental Baptist, the new N N N NIFB or IFB or whatever. And many of them, they are on the bandwagon of there's no dispensations and, and the Darby started the rapture, pre-rapture. Yeah. You need to read this book. It shows you way before Darby preacher, preaching dispensationalism and things like that. So 
Uh, a lot of people today, they'll go by tradition. What is tradition? Something that a man says, yep. that another man says, that another man says, that generations later people believe because some man said it. So you have to be very careful what you say, or you could start a tradition that is anti-biblical that will deceive people for many generations. Yeah. You know what tradition is? Uh, sorry? Tradition, uh, tradition is peer pressure from dead men. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Dead men. Now, there's good tradition and bad tradition. Remember, yeah. I showed you that. Let me show you good tradition. Did we read 2 Thessalonians 3, 6? Yeah, we did. Okay, so we already read that, where Paul says the tradition from him. So one of the main themes is whenever people fall into bad tradition, it always seems like they're leaving Paul out. Yeah. And you can't do that. You can't leave out the Apostle Paul. So it's very, very important. So I um, grew up going to churches as a kid. And, uh, and around that time, back in the 70s, there were Pentecostals that came out. And I think my dad was Episcopalian and, and Catholic and things like that before he got saved. My mom was Baptist. But then when these, uh, these charismatics or charismaniacs came out, uh, Pepsi-costals, I like to call them. And, uh, you know, I'll just call them as I see them. I don't see them as preaching truth. I see them as preaching tradition. And that tradition started with a woman. Look into the Azuzu Street Revival. It was started by a woman. Yeah. The Bible is very clear. There's four verses at least that are very much against women pastors. And people get upset nowadays. Oh, I can't believe you read the Bible. You're either following it or you're not. It says husband of one wife. What part of husband of one wife do you not understand? That's right. Um, so you look into that and you see that tradition and that was really big and my mom and dad started going to these churches to hear this man named phineas dake and he was a pentecostal and this pentecostal movement went all around and that really messed them up hmm. and uh, messed them up so much that mom divorced my dad and uh it was just a mess and it messed my life up because then i went into that denomination but then i saw the truth and the truth is you only get saved once and once saved always saved is the bible teaching Amen. That denomination did not teach that to me. Yeah. And that never sat well with me. And I always worried about it. And I always thought, oh, my goodness, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'll ever save. I'd cry myself to sleep at night thinking I lost it. But how do you lose something you don't have? I didn't even have it. And the Bible is very clear that when you get saved, let me show you this. I don't want to give you uh, my saying so that you'll think I'm teaching tradition. I want you to know what the Bible says. Amen. And according to the Bible. Let's go to Ephesians. Again, I have to pull this up. Ephesians chapter 1. And according to the Bible, when you're saved, you can't lose the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, that denomination taught me, and they said, yeah, you can. It can come and go and come and go and come and go, and you can lose it and get it back and lose it and get it back and lose it and get it back. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. That is not what the Bible says. And so that is something that I learned by reading my Bible. Because before, it was just tradition. And the Bible says in Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. If it's sealed, how is it coming out? That's right. It comes out, but it wasn't sealed. So once saved, always saved is a Bible doctrine Amen. that the body of Christ has believed for the last 2,000 years, the true believers. And if you're going around saying there's no such thing as once saved, always saved, then you are teaching a tradition that started with a woman in Azuzu Street. That's and right. You're teaching a man made false doctrine of you can lose your salvation. Amen. Now, look at the comma right there. It's a comma. Comma, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. And earnest is a down payment. Yeah. So when you put down earnest money, that's your intent. Hey, this thing's mine. And it's the purchased possession. So our soul is redeemed by the blood of Jesus and can exactly. never go to hell. But what is the inheritance? It's the glorified body that we get. And that's when we get that at the rapture. So without the rapture, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're only half saved, I guess. But uh, if you're not saved, I mean, if you're not believing the Bible that once you're saved, you're always saved, then are you saved? How well, can you be saved thinking you can lose it? To me, yeah. you never understood it, so you never got it. Because if you got it, you would understand it's not something that can be lost, be, or lost because it was a free gift. Amen. And it's based upon your works. 
You see, that's what I was taught in the Pentecostal church. I got to do good works or else I'll lose it. Now I'm trying to save myself. Now I'm the lost religious person because I'm thinking it's what I do that gets me to heaven. And that's not what gets you to heaven. It's trusting only in what Jesus did. So yeah. it bothers me. And it's very sad to see how strong tradition is. So I got saved. And uh, when I came home, I had been four years in that false denomination. But growing up, we went to Southern Baptist churches, went to Pentecostal churches, and we went once or twice. Uh, well, a couple of times we went to an independent Baptist church. And boy, I was all messed up as a kid. But uh, I didn't know much, but I knew, you know, that, that Catholics weren't right because I read the chick tracks on that and stuff like that. Yeah. But I wasn't saved. And then I got in the Pentecostal church for four years and then came back home. And that's when my dad led me to the Lord. And I realized, wow. You mean it is once saved, always saved? Praise God. Well, then I believe. And now I'm saved and I know I'm saved. And I believe with all my heart, not just with my head. And Amen. I'm only in what Jesus did to take me to heaven. So if you think you can lose salvation, you you don't understand salvation. Yeah. How could you even be saved? I, I just I have a hard time believing that a person can be saved and be a part of that. But maybe you can be saved and be in that church. But then wouldn't the Holy Spirit leave you or lead you out? Yeah. Because you're basically spitting in Jesus' face saying, no, it's not good enough what you did. Look at what I do, God. To Let me into heaven because I did this because you didn't do enough. Wouldn't that be utter and complete blasphemy yeah. against God? So why would someone want to belong to any sort of denomination that believes in their tradition rather than the Bible? And that's sad. That's sad. So I got saved and i started going to bible school um and i started to learn the bible and i went out as a missionary in honduras and as i went out as a missionary in honduras i began to see a lot of tradition okay a lot of tradition and it it bothered me and i began to see a lot of pastors and preachers that claimed they were one thing but they acted as something else or they claimed to believe this but they taught the yeah tradition rather than the bible and that has always been something that bothered me. And I made up my mind as a young man in the ministry that I'm always going to follow God in the Bible. Not me, because I don't care what men think about me. And so I went as a missionary to Honduras. On, and before I went to Honduras as a missionary, I went on what's called deputation. Yeah. And deputation is you calling up pastors and telling them, hey, God's called me to go do this. And I'd like to preach in your church and show my work. And then you guys can vote on whether you want to support my ministry so that I can go do that. And I went to um, 200 churches at least. I know it was, it's over 200 churches. I went and counted them. I would go, um, sometimes I was in one church on Sunday morning, another church on Sunday night. And then another church on Wednesday night and another church on Thursday night. Sometimes they had Thursday night service. So in three years, I did deputation. And it was over 200 churches that I went to and I preached in. And the thing that shocked me is that I, every church I went to, I said, somebody here tell me where the gospel is. And only 11 times did they ever say it's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. All the other times, they just kind of looked at each other. I said, I want to know where is the passage of Scripture in the Bible that says this is the gospel? Yeah. One guy raised his hand. Oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Those are gospels. <laughs> but where is the passage of Scripture that says, moreover, brother, and I declare unto you the gospel? And you know just how ignorant many of them were? They did not know where it was. Yeah. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And that is the gospel. And so we're told in the Bible to go preach the gospel. And yeah. I'm going to all these churches. And I was naive and young, of course. But I was expecting them to at least be doing that. And many of them didn't even know where it was in the Bible. Yeah. That's what was bothersome to me. That's what made me so sad is to see how few people there are out there, especially pastors. And, you know, many times the pastors didn't even know where that was. And they came up, well, thanks for showing me that. I didn't see that before. Okay, I'll be preaching that from now on. I'm like, you mean you weren't? <laughs> I mean, you're supposed to be an ordained gospel minister, minister of the gospel, and you didn't even know where the gospel was in the Bible? That just bothered me. So here it is, it's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You know, Paul's here, if you're watching this, and, and read that for yourself. That's the gospel. So the gospel is what Jesus did to save you. It's not what we do. Amen. Well, I got support, and I went to Honduras as a missionary for seven years. And down there, I run into other missionaries. I run into so-called pastors and churches. Many of them didn't even know what the gospel was. 
know. Many of them are preaching the lovey dovey, you know, one, two, three, repeat after me yep. type of gospel. And and uh, it's the lovey dovey, oh, if you just love Jesus and open your heart to him. I don't even know what that means. Open That's your crazy. heart. Okay. Jesus, I open. Come on in. I mean, that makes no sense to me what that even means. Yeah. That's not the Bible doctrine and teaching of trust the blood atonement through faith, yeah. being saved by faith. Invite Jesus into your heart. Invite Jesus into your life. Ask Jesus into your heart. Those I was against because those are not in the Bible. That's Amen. man in tradition. And uh, many of your churches nowadays, they all say, just ask Jesus in your heart. Do you know where that comes from, Fabio? Where? Oh, I, I know Revelation. Revelation? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. There, there's one passage. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any yeah. man open, and I will come into him and sup with him. That's the door of a church. That's not the door yeah. of the heart. So Take that's number up. one, taking yeah. something out of context, which would be what? Tradition. Amen. But the only thing I could find of asking Jesus into somewhere, I went back and found that that's the Catholics would teach people, ask Mary to come into you. Open your heart to Mary. Ask. It's almost like our churches that are supposed to be King James Bible believing churches. They are adopting Catholic dictation or their Catholic yeah. speech. That's a Catholic speech. Invite into your a saint, into your heart or open your heart to. I mean, it's it's weird how those that claim to be true Bible believers are using the words of the world or, or maybe not of the world, but of the apostate church. Yeah. So I never, ever liked when people say, just ask Jesus in your heart, because, you know, that's not in the Bible. Yeah. Nowhere Amen. in the Bible does it say, just ask Jesus in your heart. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, ask God to save you. Did you know that? Yeah. Nowhere does it say that. That's something that bothered me, too, because a lot of churches say, well, just ask God to save you. I asked God to save me every night from age 13 to 18, and I was not saved. That's Why? right. Because I asked him to do it, but I didn't trust the blood. Yeah. I didn't know the gospel. I didn't understand until I was 18 years old. So there's a lot of people out there that are still lost because there's a lot of tradition that's in the way, and it's like it blinds them to the truth. And the Bible is called light. It's called the light of the glorious gospel, the light of, of the scripture. You know, the, the light. The Bible is a light that shineth, a lamp unto our feet. And so if you go to the Bible, that will expose all that, and you'll see the truth, and you'll be able to push all that away and say, oh, oh, so salvation is by faith. Oh, oh, it's by believing. Oh, and then believing in what? In the blood. And um, I'm so thankful that God has used me over the years to preach what the Bible says. And I've always made up my mind, I'm just going to preach what the Bible says, not what man says. And boy, have I seen uh, a lot of people that claim to be King James Bible believers, and they just preach what man says, not what the Bible says. Yeah. What does the Bible say? For by grace you save through faith. faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No. And faith in what? Well, Romans 3.25 says, Whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Yeah. And you realize that's in the beginning of our King James Bible? Now, many King James Bibles, they don't put the original uh, preface that was in it. Some of them might put in the epistle dedicatory in the front, you know, that calls the Pope the man of sin. But a lot of them don't have the entire preface. But if you have the King James Bible that has the entire preface, it says through faith in his blood. So a true King James Bible believer would be one who's preaching the Bible and preaching what they believe is that we're saved by faith in the blood. But, uh, Fabrielle, we have a lot of people out there that aren't true King James Bible believers today, are we? Oh, boy. Yeah. Man, I got some friends who are not, man. It's a struggle because, you know, sometimes I join up on them and stuff, and they're doing their own Bible study, and some one is reading from the KJV, another is reading from the NIV, and they're saying complete different things. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like face palm the whole time. I'm like, you know, it's it just bothers me big time. How can you mix the word of God with a perversion? That's what they Amen. are. They're perversions. They they make Jesus mm -hmm. Christ a liar. Some of them make Jesus Christ a liar. Some of them take out the blood. Some of them call Jesus Christ the devil by combining I, uh, Isaiah. I think it was four. Uh, what was it in 14. Revelation? Called the Morning Star. You know, they yeah. they twist that and you know end up calling Jesus Christ the devil, dude. Like. It's, it gets really irritating. How can people say, well, they all say the same thing, except with the these and the vows. Yeah, all right, baloney. I tell you baloney because I can pull up many versions right now and show to you. I got a Bible app in my phone where I can combine versions, and I can show you that they don't say the same thing. None Amen. of them do. 
So yeah. Yeah, like for example, right here in the chat, we have an, an example of tradition yeah. and lie being taught instead of truth. Someone says the NASB is the most accurately translated Bible. That stands for the New American Standard Bible. And you're laughing because we know that that is the absolute opposite of the truth. The New yeah. American Standard Bible, the NIV, the non-inspired version, all new versions of the Bible come from the Gnostic Catholic critical texts from people who are transi trannies and homosexuals. That's right. And Amen. From the Alexandrian text. I had this woman call me on the phone. I believe it was a couple days ago. And she told me, God told me to call you. I said, really? Well, God, God told you to tell me something. What is it? She said that you're doing wrong and all this stuff. And I'm like, um, you know, I think this woman might have a demon. There's something wrong with her. Well, and then she the said, G. what now? The little G God called her. Yeah, the little <laughs> G God, not the big G God. And uh, so she was telling me, you know, well, my version, and I said, you're not King James only. I said, do you know why that the King James is the only Bible? And she's like, well, why don't you tell me? I said, because it comes from the text of a pervert who cut off his own penis because he didn't know how to rightly divide. Oh, she got upset. Oh, you're offending me. Oh, how, how dare you? I said, but that's absolute truth. You don't yeah. want to hear the truth? The guy yeah. castrated himself. Yeah. And now he's castrating our Bible by that's cutting right. out verses just as he cut himself. And we're supposed to accept that. Yeah. We didn't accept that. So we're talking, of course, of origin. Origin, who was behind the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is a awful translation of the Bible. It is a Greek translation, the Septuagint, and it is full of errors and mistakes. And from that version came the LXX, which is the Vulgata, or Vulgate, which is the official Roman Catholic Bible. But Origen, he, um, he was a Gnostic, if you will, and he claimed to be a Christian, but he read that verse in Jesus where he said, if your right hand offended, cut it off. Well, he thought to himself, well, I, I have dirty thoughts about women, so maybe that offends me. Snip, snip. And he castrated yeah. himself. He did not rightly divide. No, he didn't. <laughs> he actually, I mean, how else would you would you call him but a nutcase that ought to be in an insane asylum? I yeah. mean, I can't think of anybody else worse than maybe Van Gogh who cut off his own ear. Well, that's the failure of realizing the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. But also the difference between Jesus' ministry to Jews yeah. and Paul. That's right. So, yeah. <laughs> New versions of the Bible. <clears throat> All of them come from the corrupt text. Hold on a sec. These corrupt texts are two manuscripts. Vaticanus, Sinaiticus. <clears throat> yeah. I'm losing my voice. Let me get it back. You, you tell us about it. Okay. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. I think they found one, one of them. Uh, I'm not sure which one, but one of them they found in a monastery in a garbage dump. You know, yep. uh, they found it in a garbage dump, and I'm, I forgot where they found the other one. But basically, it was in a, another monastery, I guess. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. But basically, okay. those those two uh, those two texts they're extremely corrupt. They come from Alexandria. If you if you uh, if you go in your Bible, do a survey in your Bible on Egypt, Alexander Egypt, you'll find that it's not a very good place. In fact, when when a Christian, or I'm, I wouldn't I'll say that lightly, but when, when I think it was in Apollos, I think it was or a Jew, a certain Jew left uh, Egypt, he came straight to uh, to Antioch, and they had, he had to get corrected by the scripture because he was still teaching the baptism of John. So that just tells you that just because uh, you go to Egypt don't mean you're going to get the correct source. In origin, you know, again, he was heavily messed up in his doctrine. He was the type of person who would not take things literally, you know, and if he did take it literally, he'll miss the context, <laughs> you know. Right. So, yeah. Okay. There, so, you know. all right. So Paul even tells us that in his day, there were people that were corrupting the word of God. And if you want the true Bible, where would you go in the Old Testament? You would go to Jerusalem because right. Jews wrote the Bible and I believe they wrote it in Hebrew. So they wrote it there. And that's where you find the pure word of God, the Hebrew Masoretic text, because the priests were called Masorites or Masorites. And so that's where the true version of the Bible comes from. Then for the New Testament, you would go to Antioch of Syria, because in Acts chapter 11, it says that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And from yeah. Antioch is the school of Antioch, from which all the Greek manuscripts come on the New Testament, and they're in agreement something like 95% of the time, and that's where the Textus Receptus comes from, which is where our King James Bible comes from. Textus Receptus 
and Hebrew Masoretic text. Now they had all these other texts too, but they were like, man, those are errors. No, we're going with these because this is the right fountain. All new versions of the Bible come from two manuscripts. Well, actually, there's three. There's Alexandria, and then there's another one. I forget which one that is. But the two main texts that all new versions of the Bible come from are Vat Echanus. <laughs> Vat is where poison is stored. And Anus. <clears throat> oh, anyway. yeah. uh, Vat Echanus and Sin Eaticus. Sin and Cuss. Cussing isn't good. And Vaticanus was found in the Vatican in the 1400s by, um, I remember, was it Napoleon or someone? And uh, they said, wow, this looks old. And so they thought it was old, but it had problems. It had errors. It had mistakes in it. But they said, well, we believe this is the oldest translation. Well, the Sinaiticus was found in a garbage bin yeah. in a Catholic monastery. And a man named Tischendorf found it and said, I, I believe this is the oldest translation. And he took it. And there's a thing. Is it called Weed and Tears? I forget. But there's a great YouTube video where a man does a documentary about the Bible. Oh, yeah. I know, I know it. It's we the Wheat and Tears, something like that. Yeah. And it shows how that was probably a forgery done by a guy named, and you tell me what was his name, Simonides or Simonides or something like that. I forgot. Who, who falsified a New Testament. And so it's not as old as they claim it to be. So yeah. all the new versions of the Bible are based upon fraud. They're yeah. fraudulent. And Tischendorf was fraudulent. And they took and they made what they called the critical texts. In the critical text, they tried to replace the Textus Receptus, which is over 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament that are almost always in agreement. Yeah. And yet you're supposed to say, but we don't want to go by all those. Let's take these other two. One of them's proven to be fraud and the other one's full of errors and mistakes. Let's make a Bible like that. And along come Westcott and Hort and Lockman and all these other people. But Westcott and Hort put together their critical Greek New Testament and mm -hmm. they put it out in 1881. And all new versions of the Bible do not go to the same fountain that the King James comes from, which is yeah. a perfect inerrant, infallible word of God from the true fountain. New versions come from the Catholic corrupt Gnostic fountain, and they That's come right. from Westcott and Hort's um, New Testament, because that New Testament was taken by Allen, Kurt Allen, and it's called the Nestle Allen, okay? Ebert Nestle. I've but heard. The mm -hmm. GNT3, now it's called the GNT4 or GNT5, but it's also called the Nestle Allen text. That is the Greek text that all new versions of the Bible come from, and that is a perverted, corrupted text. And yeah. if you open it, it says in the front, this is not to be taken as what? As reliable. Wow. <laughs> all of these liars in pulpits that claim to be pastors that use new versions of the Bible and say, this is the more reliable translation. Yeah. The very source that it came from says, but it's not to be taken as reliable. So we see a tradition within scholarship itself, so-called Christian scholarship, in yeah. which are usurping the authority of the true Bible, the King James, and trying to say, no, you need to read this one. But this one is full of errors and mistakes, and it does make God a liar. It does give the name of Jesus to Satan. It does take away that Jesus, uh, that Mary was, was a virgin when Jesus was born. Yeah. It does make Jesus a sinner. And Gail Ripplinger, G-A-I-L, Ripplinger, oh, yeah. Book. Um, she's she's yeah. getting up in age. I wanted to have her on in the live stream, but just pray for her. She's doing so well. Keep her in prayer. But she wrote an excellent book called New Age Bible Versions. And she proves that it is Satan that is behind these new versions of the Bible. Now, she yeah. wrote another book, Hazardous Materials. Oh, it's I have. 1,300 pages. I read it in one day. I couldn't put it down. And in the back of that book, she shows Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort are praised by so-called Bible scholars. Oh, they're such big, great Bible scholars. They were a bunch of ninnies. I don't know what's a good English term. A bunch of hippie ninnies. I mean, I mean, if they were men who were not reliable, and they were liars, and they were closet Catholics. And a man named Dean Burgeon started the Dean Burgeon. Well, no, the other man started the Dean Burgeon Society, but Dean Burgeon studied their Greek New Testament. He says, this is laughable. This this is not scholarly. But in the many schools today, they teach that, oh no, Westcott and Hort were great men. Westcott and Hort were evil. Yeah. Westcott and Hort believed in 
communion of the saints, which at that time in the Anglican church was going into an empty church in the middle of the night and praying. Okay, what's wrong with that? Until a saint talks back to you. <laughs> Remember in the Bible, it talks about seducing spirits and doctrines of death. Yeah. Westcott and Hort believed that it was okay to pray and then listen to whatever speaks back to you and pretend that that was of God. Boy, it'd be pretty easy for a demon to get in and talk to you, wouldn't it? That's right. So they were demonically possessed and oppressed to put out their false version of the Bible. And yet that's where all new versions of the Bible come from. Secondly, Westcott and Hort belonged to a group of cross-dressers. And they would come together in meetings, and one of them would dress as a man, another as a woman. They'd come in pairs. They were your first trannies. Wow. So if you use any new version of the Bible, you're using the tranny version. That's so right. Yeah. How Amen. can anybody, even in our chat, how could anybody say the New American Standard Bible is the best translation? You you, you know nothing. That's right. <laughs> Tranny loving, right. Gnostic loving, Catholic. I mean, do you even know what you're saying? That's See, right. I'm frustrating. I don't want to put people down, but the absolute ignorance just bothers me wow. because I want people to have the true word of God, the true Bible, the King James Bible. Amen. So the King James Bible is the only true word of God, and we see the fruit from the King James Bible. Now, Westcott and Hort, they were evil, evil men, and uh, people have read their correspondence, and, and many times they'd write to each other and say, I don't know if I can believe in the virgin birth. I don't know if I believe in these miracles. They were not believers in Christ. The New International Version, okay, the NIV, it has come out that there were two homosexuals that worked on the NIV. Now, I'm not going to go into homosexuality or whatever and tell you what I think about it. You know what yeah. the Bible says about it. But a lot of people claim to be Christians and say, but we're not into homosexuality. Then why do you use a Bible yeah. if homosexuals worked on it? Yeah, maybe you need to rethink whether you should use that version or should I call it a perversion oh, version? Amen. One of those was a woman, a lesbian named Mollencott, Dr. Mollencott. She changed the word in the Bible, sodomite. She changed that to temple male prostitute in the NIV. What the heck is a temple male prostitute? I don't even know what that is. OK, but uh, that a sodomite is very different. <laughs> yeah. A sodomite invokes in your head uh, a specific thing that they did in that act, right? Uh, yeah. Temple male prostitute, who knows what they did? I mean, it could have been something completely different. And I can't remember the man of the name. But when you be begin to study this, you'll find out that it's been suppressed within many so-called so -called Christian circles. Because the Catholic Church, through ecumenicalism, is trying to get in. They use Jesuits. They use all sorts of things and get all so-called Christians back into the Catholic Church. Yeah. And they're doing that with the new versions of the Bible that read more in line with the Latin Vulgate, because That's that right. is the critical, the first critical text. And so if you use any version of the Bible other than the King James, guess what? You're right over here, close to the Catholic Church. We're That's way right. over here. So you're closer to the apostasy than we are. Why don't you take an about face and come over to us Amen. with the true word of God? Amen. Why do you want a watered down perversion of the Bible? Now add something to that. Basically, yeah, well, what you went through was right. And again, this comes back to, uh, you know, emotions. You know, well, my dad, my mom gave me an NIV. So, and I love my mom and she gave me an NIV for Christmas or, or, you know, my dad gave me this, this other perversion here. And, you know, I loved my dad. So it, it ties back to emotion. It's, it's all about emotion. It's what you're brought up with. You know, when you're taught as a child, you're taught as a child certain things, you know, so those customs can be good or they can be bad, depending if the Bible aligns with them or not. So it's just what you're brought up with. And sadly, we live in the world that uh, we're, as, as the Bible says, we're, we're living right now in, in the age of apostasy. The, the, the last days of the church are very near. Uh, we're living in the Laodicean age, Laodicea, that is uh, the civil rights of the people. So the people decide what's right. And judges will read. They they did what was right in their own eyes. That's precisely what we're seeing right now. And and it's a real shame. You know, it took me some time. Me personally, it took me some time to settle what is the real Bible because they don't all say this. That's the same thing. If you're truly honest, you can say no, no. They all say the same thing. No, like calm down. Go go to your house. Go to your room and get yourself a translation. Any translation, compare with the King James Bible and read. And read word for word. You can you have different study helps online that show you where they contradict. And you got to take it at face value. You got to say, hey, look, there, there's something wrong here. 
you know if you're honest with if someone is honest with themselves they'll clearly see that there are contradictions within uh within the different uh translations so you got to choose one the, there has to be a final authority the people mm -hmm. who new, use the new translations they say mm -hmm. the final authority is the bible but they're liars when they say that now why do i say that because whenever they read something that they don't like they resort to the greek but there's a problem with that. What which Greek texts are we talking about? Nestle Anland, uh, West God and Hor, the text of Receptus, which one? You know, they, they won't answer that question. When they say, Well, the text of Receptus, well, then which edition? Are we, are we talking about Stephanus's Greek text? Are we talking about Erasmus? Are we talking about Bezos? You know, because when people run to the text of Receptus, correct the King James Bible, what you got to keep in mind is that the translators they used one, uh, uh, they borrowed some from Visa and borrowed some from Erasmus and formulated and went through the King James Bible. And if you read your Bible, you notice there's some inspiration uh, in that Bible. There's some stuff in there that some of it is not even found in the Greek text. But sometimes the Lord used those men to to inspire them to to put something in there that not many other people uh not not, not the the uh, the manuscript that they had in their their day would not say. And later on, they found out, oh, look, you know, through the Dead Sea Scrolls, I think, I think in First John, where, where uh, there's an italicized in First John. Let me find it real quick. I just want to give a, one example here. Okay, uh, go ahead. This Bible is, is, is not no mere, uh, uh, the scripture came not in an old time by the will of man. Let me find it real quick. Uh, What's it say? Okay. First John. First John, First John chapter 2, verse 23. This is an example right here. First John chapter two, verse 23. Whosoever denieth the son, the same hath not the father. Now the rest is an italicized. But he that acknowledges the son hath the father also. Italicized words, if you go there. First John chapter two. Right. First John two twenty three. We're there. Though uh in the in the Bible app it'll, it'll have a little faded out, but basically that's italicized. The King James the King James translators decided to add that there, even though their their text didn't have that there. It's not until later that uh, the, some Greek manuscripts were found that contained those exact words. So they didn't know about it, but it's like, oh, whoa, we were felt to add this there. And then later on, they find out, oh wait, you know, some of the Greek manuscripts had this, you know, already. So, so it's just you know how God moved in the trans It has to have been God that gave us the King James Bible because he said in Psalms 12, 6, and 7 that he would preserve his word. And God is not a liar. Amen? Yeah. Psalms yeah. chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Yeah. So let us say this too, though, because there's some people in the chat that, oh, NASB, or no, what about Intel, NLTB, or what? They're asking about every version that's modern is not from the same fountain as yeah. the King James. All new versions of the Bible come from the tranny text, which That's is the right. critical text Amen. from the Gnostic Catholic uh, text, which is wrong. So throw those out and keep the King James. Now, they say, well, I don't understand Old English. Um, it's, it's My not dad old. gave me a King James Bible when I was eight years old. I read it my whole life. Age eight to age 18, before I was even saved, I understood every word. Mm -hmm. I tried to read a new version once, and I was like, that's not making any sense. There's the Chick Tracks. You know, you can go to Chick.com, C-H-I-C-K.com. They have a little thing that's like 600 words. Yeah. It's 50 cents. There's only 600 words in the King James Bible that you may have a problem with. And you can buy this little thing and keep it in your Bible and look it up. So, you know, people are saying, well, I didn't know what this word meant. I didn't know it. There's a thing called a dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we buy a dictionary instead of buying a new perversion of the Bible? Yeah. You know that in Spanish, and so if it's in Spanish, it's probably in English as well, because uh, the the Greek New Testament of Westcott and Hort that then became Nestle Allen, it became called the GNT, the Greek New Testament. Did you know there was a guy named Martini, Cardinal Martini, who worked on it, who worked with the Pontifical Institute of Rome, the Pontifical uh, Bible Institute of Rome? And in the 1960 Spanish Bible, when you buy a 1960 Spanish Bible, something like 5 or 10% goes to Rome. Yeah. Because they're claiming part of the cop. So if you want to be a Roman Catholic, go buy a new version of the Bible. There you go. And that's you giving a tithe, let's say, to the Catholic yeah. Church. And I'm sure they'll appreciate that. But oh. you know who won't appreciate that? God. Yeah. That's another reason why I cannot use a new version of the Bible because I don't want to help the Pope. Amen. I don't want to help tradition. I don't want to give my money to those people. And you know the King James Bible is not copyrighted? 
in the sense that it's not something that you can't copy. Now, when they put out the King James, they supposedly put a copyright on it. Yeah. In order for it to be not changed, but it's a free copyright for anyone to quote it. If I wanted to quote other versions of the Bible, I would have to send some money to the people who put that out for me to quote that. Did you know that? Yeah. In or in other things. I'm not paying the Pope for my right to yeah. speak what the Bible says. Amen. And that's, that's so sad that new. That, so I'm not, we're not calling people liars. No. We're saying you could be, you're just ignorant. You don't know these things. Yeah. But now that you know these things, how could you say that version's better? Now you're lying. Okay? Yeah. Because maybe you just didn't know. Now that you know, you don't want to help the Pope. You don't want the Gnostic perversion put out by perverts who castrate themselves and dress Amen. like women. You don't want that Bible, do you? No. Well, I don't understand it. Um, all you have to do is get that little chick track thing, and you'll understand the words that you don't understand. The King James Bible was put together, and it's the seventh translation in English. God yep. always uses the number seven. Amen. Seven different languages until it came to English. And guess what? It says, appointed to be read in churches. The King James Bible was written, and it has a cadence to it. And Gail Ripplinger will show you this as well in her book, New Age Bible Versions. They have a thing called the Fleshman Kincaid Test, and they can test the reading level. And the King James Bible as a whole is about a sixth or seventh grade reading level. All new versions of the Bible are way up there, like a ninth or tenth or eleventh grade reading yeah. level. And people run around and they lie and say, the King James is too hard to understand. And yet scientifically, okay, trust the science, says yeah. Dawson, scientifically proven the King James is on a lower reading level than new versions. Yeah. So you should be able to understand it better. And it's appointed to be read in churches, which means what? Well, they put it together with like a cadence so you can memorize it and read it easier. So, for example, he that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son hath not life. Every single word is a one syllable word. How do you I mean, and, and it's so easy to read and so easy to memorize. You go to new versions of the Bible. Oh, there's multiple syllable words, four, five, six, seven syllables. You're like, what? I remember in the Spanish Bible, uh, the King James Bible talked about a, a little place where you give tithe, a little box that you put your tithe in. And in Spanish, they didn't even translate it. They left it in, in Greek, and it says gaso falacio. And it's like people reading it, what's a gaso falacio? That's not even a Spanish word, man. And yeah. so these people that put out these new versions of the Bible, I don't even think they're saved, many of them. Yeah. I've shown before on my channel the, what's called the Children's Living Bible by Kenneth Taylor. You go to the Children's Living Bible, and you read where in our King James Bible, Saul says to his son, thou son, the, you, thou son of a, a perverse and rebellious woman. The new That translation by Kenneth Taylor says, you S-O-B. It literally spells it out, B-I-T and the rest. Man. And that's for children. New versions of the Bible teach children to cuss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why isn't that? But no, many within our churches today are deceived. And I think it's because many of them aren't even saved because they're religious but lost. Yeah. And those that are, are saved are unfortunately uh, ignorant of these things. Yeah. And that's why more and more people need to come out and say, hey, look at this and study this and realize. And if you're not using the King James, you've got a watered down perversion of the Bible. That's and right. God, God says his word is powerful. And you know what he says? He said, blessed are they that keep that hear the word of God and keep it. Yeah. You are not keeping the word of God, the King James, and you're quick to run to some other version. Are you going to be blessed? Yeah. I mean, you want to be blessed, right? Well, he yeah. said, I'll bless you if you keep my word. The NIV has 60 to 70,000 words less than the King James Bible. Mm. What a blessing. No, what a curse. You're cursed because That's you're right. not using the true word of God. So, it's so sad to see how people turn from the true word of God and buy into all the lies that are being perpetrated by the Papa Papon in Rome, all right, the, the yep. Pope. And uh, we could get into Spanish, too. I know Fabriel hablas espanol. You speak Spanish. Say something in Spanish real quick. That's the thing. You know, when, when, it, when I go back to that, people say the King James Bible is too hard to read to understand. But when I look at my life, I grew up speaking Spanish. The first language I learned was Spanish. And if this Spanish boy is straight from Arahialia, con los cubanos y todo, you know, with Cubans and every Spanish speaking and everything, 
I understood my Bible, my King James Bible. What's your excuse? I didn't, I, you know, it, I had to learn English. So, you know, so it's, it's no excuse. And even then, even if you grew up speaking English or there's no excuse for you not to understand it. There is not, it's written what, like, we just went through like third grade, fifth grade English, something like that. Like a, a child can understand this, you know, exactly. Exactly. I, I, I have, we have children in our church who understand the King James Bible. They understand what it says. I mean, if a child can do it, why can't you? You know? <laughs> Amen. And the King James Bible is amazing. The these and thous. They always say, I don't understand the thee and thou. Do you realize that the thee and thou have to be there? Because exactly. that's from the Greek language. And in other languages, we have a way of formal way of and an informal way of talking and things like that. It, Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, or I say unto you, ye must be born again. And you got to understand, he's talking to everybody there, not yeah. just one person. Nicodemus, yeah. And uh, so I say unto thee, and so uh, it, it's it's applying to all of us. New versions just say I say unto you. So he's just saying, hey, Nicodemus, you need to get saved. You need to get born again. So I guess in new versions, nobody else needs to get born again, just Nicodemus, yeah. because just Jesus said it to him, yeah. you. No, but when you read the King James Bible, the word, I believe it's really I say unto thee, thee yeah. is all of us we all need to be born again so it does affect doctrine and people are either completely ignorant and it's because yep. there's no pastor standing up telling the truth or they are lying on purpose yeah and, uh, they're working for the pope there's no other way to say it now when it comes to spanish bible i won't go into that but you can go to youtube and look up my uh, uh video on the history of the spanish bible and you'll really see that how the catholic church prohibited people to read the bible then when they made it into Spanish, how they persecuted them and how they realized, well, we can't win. So then they just pushed in all the Catholic uh, stuff into their. And so you get perversions in in Spanish. And the 1960 is one of the worst. It's put out by Eugene Nida, who who we even wonder is even a saved man. <laughs> Many of us. Uh, <laughs> crazy. But um, I want I want people to see this. And, and it's fun to yeah. find other believers that already know it and, and can see this. But why don't people talk about this, Fabriel? Uh, again, it comes from, you know, tension because America has this mentality or, you know, how I was taught, you know, how my family taught me is, you know, you don't talk about religion or politics with the family. You don't do that. No religion or politics. You know, that's that's the, the main idea there. So don't because they don't want no division or nothing and they want everyone to be easygoing. They just want to love each other to help, basically. That's, that's the thing. They want to love each other, uh, each other to hell because the Bible says that the word brings division. When you get saved, it brings division within you. Your flesh is cut off from your spirit. When you get saved, not only does it bring division within you, but it's also going to bring division within others. All right. And it's the same thing with doctrine, doctrine as well. Uh, doctrine naturally divides. Doctrine is teaching. All right. Now, everyone else, you know, most people have their own doctrine of how they live their life, or that doctrine could be tradition in this case. But once you start to get your doctrine from the Bible, and if another person doesn't read his Bible, they're going to be like, hey, oh, wait a second there. You know, that's not what my dad taught me. You're wrong, you know, and that's when division happens, you know, and mm -hmm. people don't want division. That's where you get the ecumenicism movement coming on. Oh, let's all come together. Let's all be just fine. Hey, you, you, you see NASB here? Come, come join. Oh, hey, you're gay. That's okay. You can preach from our pulpit. You'll be fine. Oh, you're a drag queen here. Come present yourself before these kids. You'll be fine. You know, that's, that's the main thing that's going on. They want to forsake doctrine. They want to abandon doctrine and just say, hey, let's everyone come together, you know, because to the because if there's no tension, it's gonna automatically, I guess, fleshly feel good for you. I remember I was listening to some preaching by Ian Paisley, right? And Ian Paisley, of course, he was a Presbyterian uh, preacher, but I believe he had some good stuff to say. And there was a sermon where he was talking about how, you know, there was a lady in his church who doesn't like didn't like his church because there's a lot of fighting going on, and and she was like, well, in my church we have perfect peace, and Ian Paisley was like. Oh, it's good that you have peace, but the peace you got is the peace of the dead. <laughs> the peace of the dead. And once you're saved, you ought to be fighting for the Lord. You ought, to be, in, you, you ought to be armored up with a sword, with a sword, the King James Bible in your right hand and the shield of faith in your other hand. And you ought to go forth and pierce all the people with the word of God. How do you pierce them? By sharing the gospel with them, by trying to getting them saved. 
because you know the church age is like a type it's a huge type of the millennium when the millennium comes by when the lord jesus christ when we when we come back after the seven year tribulation of course we were get raptured before the seven year tribulation but once we come back we're going to be doing exactly that but physically but the church age is a spiritual application of that because we're piercing people we're stabbing other people but how we're stabbing them spiritually through the bible by getting them saved right right well the millennium right huge type of that that's how the lord works he works in types and shadows you see it all throughout the whole bible so yeah so the verse here says the fear of man bringeth a snare but whoso putteth his trust in the lord shall be safe and that's the problem in the world today is people are afraid of men yeah and we're seeing that more and more in our day uh people being afraid to speak out because oh, what will they say of me if i say that yeah, that's uh, right. You're basically, going against most of so called modern biblical scholarship to say what we said, which is absolute truth. And they'll say, no, we don't believe that because they're deceived. And yet, I'm not afraid. I'm going to tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> the King James Bible is the true word of God. It came from the right yeah. text. Um, it's, I believe, even the italics are inspired. And I believe God yeah. was on it. And I believe all new versions are perversions of the scriptures. And we need to stay away from them. So we're seeing a lot of people in the in the chat. Some of them are arguing. Some of them aren't. Well, see, this isn't about arguing. This is about edifying. We don't want anyone to argue. We want to be edified. We want you to know the truth. So I went out as a minister, and I went on deputation, and I saw a lot of problems. And I went to Honduras as a missionary, and I saw firsthand Catholicism and how it impoverished the nation and the people and how sad it was that they didn't know they were saved. And like you said, a lot of people, they don't want to talk about salvation. That's the most important thing to talk about. How do you get saved? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. The Catholic will say, yes, we agree with you. It's through the wine. No, wine is not blood. <laughs> yeah. now, you've got a different, you got a different blood. It's not the blood in the cup that saves you. It's the blood he shed on the cross that's now offered on the mercy seat in heaven that saves us. So as Christians, we are told in the Bible to earnestly contend for the faith. And there are things that we cannot back down on. And I cannot back down on the King James Bible because it's the only one that is the truth. New versions take out a lot. New versions try to get you back to Rome. And new versions, uh, well, they contain errors and lies and, and things like that put out by many unsaved people. Salvation, it's only through faith in the blood atonement of Christ. That's right. And that's so important that we understand. So it's the blood, the book, and the blessed hope. The rapture, I cannot change. In a, from a pre-trib rapture to something else. That's right. Because the type is Christ coming for his bride to rescue her from the wrath to come. Amen. And, uh, I cannot change, but we see a lot of tradition. We see a lot of men changing. And I've seen it firsthand over my years in the ministry. And uh, we came back here, and I guess we saw some things in the ministry uh, of well, the group we were in that made us say, you know, we're going to have to leave. And uh, I'm, one of the best things I ever did was get away from them because a lot of people have this group mentality of, mm -hmm. oh, if we all get together, we'll work together. And look how strong group we are when we're working together. That reminds me of the Tower of Babel. Hey, let's all get together and build a tower and kick God out. Uh, no, God wasn't in that. God is not always in it when you get together because usually you kick God out. And that's what the modern ecumenical movement is is all these different denominations coming together. And the first thing they're doing is kicking out the King James Bible, yeah. kicking out the blood atonement for salvation. They're making a, a bloodless gospel. That's and they're, right. they're, they're, they're bringing in more religion and less salvation. And so I saw all that, and I decided I'm going to go my own way and do what God would have me to do. I knew it would be hard. I knew it would be tough. But I've read the Bible, and the conclusion that I come from, or come to, from reading the Bible is, all throughout the Bible, it's always one man and God. And God's saying that one man, here's what you do. And you know what? That one man and God is the majority against those that were apostate. Yeah. And, and oftentimes God would use him to get them right. So I would rather be that one man. Amen. Than be a face in the crowd and part of the group and just go along to get along. Especially yeah. when I see a lot of what they're saying and doing is wrong. So I made up uh, my mind, I'm going to leave a certain group or, or groups. I've left a lot of groups in my life <laughs> and get away and just go and serve the Lord on my own. Amen. And, uh, wow, what God has done. I mean, we've got, we just got this week, um, we reached 600,000 subscribers on the channel. 
Wow. Me. I was going, man, Lord, thank you. I mean, that had to have been God. And then, and then all the, the false accusers out there, well, you bought those, Brother Breaker. <laughs> I don't even know how to buy subscribers, but hey, if they want to lie, they can help themselves. It'll come out of the judgment. So I'll see it at the judgment, and you can take it up with God, because that is a lie. And all sorts of lies. You know, they say, you never graduated from Bible school. Well, right there is where my diploma is. So keep the lies. Keep them coming. But uh, what does the Bible say? Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So I don't want to talk about other people, but I do want to warn people about false teaching, about tradition that goes against, about lying, uh, deceiving, and, and things like that. And uh, so I've seen it, and I, I've been happy on my own serving the Lord because I look into the groups, and a lot of the groups, uh, let's just, for example, I'm an ordained independent Baptist. There's good independent Baptists, and there's not good independent Baptists. There's saved independent Baptists, and then I wonder if there's some unsaved independent Baptists, to be honest. And oftentimes, it's a tradition where many times they just want to go preach for another preacher. So it's all about, you know, I want the fame, and I want this, I want that pulpit. And I, and I never liked that. I never wanted, I never desired that. I don't want to be the big speaker, you know. I've turned down meetings because I, I just like no, I'm, I'd rather just go serve the Lord, preach online, reach people all over the world. And um, I, I don't want to be a famous. That's not what it's for for me. But with some people, it's for fame. Some people, it's for money and recognition. Uh, for some people, it's for power. And I've seen what I call Baptist popes. Oh, boy. Pulpits and, and become abusive and become. Oh, how, how could I say this? Sinful. And they go and they, they do bad things and then they cover it up. And then because yeah. they have that influence over the group, well, you can't say anything because you're all expose this on you. Yeah. And it's just so much of it is all pretend and pretense that it's hard to find a good, true brother that you can believe in yeah. because so many false ones are out there. I and, remember. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. I remember I was I attended the sermon here. I'm not going to say the name, obviously, but basically, you know, the preacher was there and he was preaching. He said these exact words that made me go like, I can't believe this. He's he legitimately said that if it, that if the pastor asks you to do something, don't pray about it. Don't 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 pray. It's Lord, is it the will you want for me? Don't don't ask the Lord nothing. Don't even pray to God. The pastor already prayed for you. You just do it. So I'm like, what? <laughs> so th that's probably the definition of a cult. Yeah. Uh, what is a cult? A cult uh, lords over you and works yeah. you to death. So they put you to work so much where you can't think for yourself. Oftentimes the food they feed you is, is not meat and protein. So you're weak Sour mind. Milk. Then you do this, you do this, you do this. And oftentimes, you know, if you don't do this, well, God's going to do this to you. And yeah. that's an outright cult. And I've seen cults, and I'm sad to see that many people are in cults because they feel like, I have to obey this guy, you know? No, you yeah. need to obey the Lord. Now, God gives us pastors a spiritual authority over us, but their spiritual authority. Yeah. And as long as they're preaching that book, hey, I can submit. But when they yeah. get away from that book, and now I'm supposed to just follow you because you say to follow you, uh, yeah. see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. You're not what God wants you to be, and I'm out of here. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have to walk away sometimes because you see things that just aren't what the Bible says. And that's so sad. And I, I, I don't like that. I want all pastors to be doing right. But there's yeah. been some big names and we don't like to name names, but there's been some pastors out there who had huge congregations who cheated on their wives. And it's well known throughout the whole. <laughs> and people are so cult mentality that they don't want to believe it, even though they know deep down in their heart. Yeah, that really happened. How a man could stand in a pulpit and preach every Sunday and claim to be a man of God, and yet he's an adulterer and he's sleeping. Well, okay, so this guy's son, they caught him, and they caught him sleeping with 24 different women in a church. And he had taken pictures of those women and put it in the dumpster. And the janitor wondered what it was and opened it up and saw it. And he's like, uh, I think I better call the cops. <laughs> yeah. How can that guy be saved? I mean... I guess you could be saved in sin. I guess he just lost all his rewards, but I don't think he ever was saved. I think he was one of those, just ask Jesus in your heart, repeat this yeah, prayer. Yeah, and he me. never understood the gospel, never heard it and believed it. I don't think he was a Christian. 
Now, yeah. I've actually seen firsthand as I traveled around to many different churches, pastors that told me, Brother Breaker, I went to a Bible school and I was taught this, that, and the other thing, and I became a pastor. And they said, while I was a pastor, I realized I was lost and I got saved. <laughs> I've met probably four or five guys like that. And I said, tell me about it. And they told me. And it, same story. They just were religious, but they weren't saved. And they yep. were following the tradition that they'd been taught, but they never came to a point in their life when they realized they were lost and they were deserved hell. And that the gospel is first Corinthians 15, one through four. And then it's trusting in the, they were trusting in themselves instead of Jesus and they got saved. Yeah. And uh, I wonder about a lot of pastors out there and I've seen a lot of things in this life that make me just go, wow. And so I would say anybody watching this, if you're a pastor, are you saved? <laughs> well, yeah. you're trying to, you know, well, no, I'm just trying to ask sincerely because yeah. we've seen so yeah. much. Are you truly saved? Because if you're saved, you'll be winning others to the Lord. If you're lost and deceived, then you'll be deceiving others into hell. Yeah. And uh, I just want people to know that the gospel is all about Christ and it should be all about him. And yet many churches you go to, it's all about someone else. It's all about the pastor. It's all about you know, he gets up there, it's all about me and me and me and I, I, and this. And you just, you, why isn't Christ having the preeminence? Because the Bible says he's to have the preeminence. So I could go on with many stories about this, but you went to a Bible school. <laughs> yeah. And what, tell us some of the things that you saw. You don't have to name the school. We don't want you to. But you saw many of the things that I saw. You Basically, saw uh, in rather than the Bible and you saw much ignorance. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, basically, um, everything was going good. You know, lovely people, down down the earth people, really good for men. Their doctrine was just all messed up, all messed up. And one of the things they would teach, you know, I think it was Thursday. Sometimes we'll go to class there on Thursday, and and the teacher would get up and he start teaching on uh, on the body of Christ. When did it start? Now, me knowing my Bible, I was Ephesians chapter three, but two two are reconciled to, with to one body by the cross, right? That's Ephesians chapter 3. So I knew that, but then they wanted to pull ahead and say, well, the body of Christ started when Jesus Christ called out his uh, his, uh, his his disciples. And I'm like, well, a local assembly, I would agree with you, started there. But the spiritual body of Christ started at the cross. And they were confusing the, the, the spiritual body of Christ with a local church, making them together. And they went ahead and said that uh, that only Baptists are the bride of Christ. And I'm like, so so you tell me you'll see Luther there sitting. He won't be sitting at the table. He'll just be referenced. Oh, good godly Baptist. <laughs> good godly Baptist. <laughs> I can already see it. You know, how, how, how can he picture that? And it just comes by tradition. As you stated, it's just tradition. Uh, that's a that's called brighter theology. Now the teacher there went ahead and made the statement. Well, you know, we're not brighter, so we don't we don't teach that the body of Christ started with John the Baptist. So we're not brighters. And I'm like, listen to the name of a Baptist brighter, Baptist brighter. Break that down. That means you believe that the Baptists are the bride. Oh, okay. You see, so they wanted to play word games. And say, well, yeah, there's this book, Old Landmarkism. They reference that book. But, you know, we're not Baptist writers because we don't believe in alcohol uh, for, for the for the Lord's mm -hmm. Supper. And we don't believe. So they were, they were like, you know, chopping, you know, chopping stuff. Well, we don't agree this. We don't agree that. But we basically believe that the Baptists are the bride of Christ. So I'm like, okay, that's a Baptist writer. <laughs> that's a Baptist writer. I mean, right. it's like. That that all starts with this guy, too, J.R. Graves. And, and they. uh they follow him, and and so there there are good Baptists and bad Baptists, and he's talking about Baptist writers. Many of your Baptist writers put so much emphasis on water baptism that a lot yeah. of times people get confused, thinking that water baptism saves you, and that's not what saves us today, according to the Paul. They'll throw around this phrase, you know, alien baptism, and they explain right. the baptism where basically uh, you you receive someone who's let's say you receive someone to your church who's been immersed properly and everything done properly, but it was from a different denomination. You got to rebaptize them again. And I'm like, because yeah. you got to them properly into the body of Christ. And I'm like, do you hear what you're saying? Hear, hear yourself. And you know where the term alien comes from? In the Bible. Because they take that word and think, well, that's just someone from another denomination. No, 
the Bible says when you were lost, you were an alien. That's that's a term for a lost person, not a safe person. That's a term for a lost person in the Bible. Now you can run and make up a little what little fantasy you want with that little word, but biblically speaking, the Bible says that an alien is some when we were aliens, we were reconciled. So let me uh let me find that verse real quick. Can you find that for me? Do you know what I'm talking about, Brother Breaker? Okay, and reconciled uh, aliens. Alien. Let me let me find out. Let me find out real quick. Uh, All right, that would be Ephesians two twelve, where we just were, and you said Ephesians three earlier. It's really Ephesians two, but uh, I do Ephesians chapter two and verse twelve, and here's what it says. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure I put that on the screen so people would see it. Was Ephesians 2. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Here's Ephesians two twelve. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of pro covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Yeah. So that term, aliens, is someone who's who's not saved. We were aliens when before you got saved, you were an alien. But once you got saved, you were no longer an alien. But they like to throw around that word and say, "Well, you see, you might be saved, but you're still an alien." It's yep. stupid. You know, they, so they don't they don't think when you. When I was out on deputation, okay, so when we went to Bible school, we were taught correctly. Yeah. And we were taught, watch out for this tradition, watch out for this tradition, watch out for this tradition, stick with the Bible, stick with the Bible, stick with the Bible. And then I went out and started preaching these churches, and I saw that tradition firsthand, and it scared me. And I'm like, why do they teach that? It's not in the Bible. It's because they follow tradition. One of the traditions they say is, well, the first Baptist was John the Baptist. <laughs> and you just kind of go, no. Uh, and he was called the Baptist because he baptized people. But yeah. the body of Christ didn't start with until Jesus died. But yeah. they tried to make the body of Christ starting with John the Baptist, the first Baptist. And it, it's either ignorance or they're truly deceived into believing that tradition so much that they go to that extreme that's so anti-biblical. And you're talking about alien Baptists. And I would always try to get out of talking about stuff like that with them. When they bring that stuff up with me, I'm thinking, how do I get away from this? Because I like to leave off contention before it be meddled with. Oh, yeah. But, yeah so they yeah. say, hey, Brother Breaker, what do you think about alien baptism? I say, well, let me just say this. If E.T. came down here to Earth in a spaceship and asked me to baptize them, I would say no. <laughs> and they usually laugh so hard they would they would drop it and would bring up any more about it. But I do not believe in, in this alien baptism thing. Yeah. When you're saved, you are baptized into the body of Christ. Yeah. That is the church. Now, yeah. there is a local church. And many Baptists believe that if you come there to be a member of their local church, they won't accept you unless you're baptized in water. You can do that. Help yourself. But don't think that saves you, number one. Yeah. And number two, don't confuse that with being baptized into the body of Christ. You're just baptized into a local assembly. Amen. That is the organization. The body of Christ is the spiritual organism. And it consists of anybody that's saved, even if they were a Lutheran, like Martin Luther, yeah. even if they were Episcopalian, or like, you know, one of our uh, famous, I think it was, uh, oh, uh, what was his name that was uh, Jackson, Andrew Jackson, president. Um, I think he was probably saved, and people like that. So uh, the body of Christ is all saved people. It doesn't matter what denomination, but they become so Baptistic yeah. that to them, the Baptist church is my country club, and unless you belong to our country club, then you probably aren't going to heaven. I mean, see how that raises that mentality of just yeah. sickening, man, that, that now you have to be a member of a club to get to heaven. Yeah. How about Jesus just saved me and that's why I'm going. Um, I've heard Baptists say, it's okay. You don't have to be a Baptist to go to heaven, but if you want to go first class, you need to be a Baptist. <laughs> and it's just, I don't go there. I don't want to get into their traditions. You know what yeah. I mean? So go ahead. Tell us some more about it. So basically, uh, that's usually what they would teach. And man, they're, they're so messed up with their eschatology. Now, in private, like sometimes one of their students would come up to me and ask me questions that they would not ask the professor. <laughs> it was just sort of funny, you know, because I'm like, wow, I'm just sitting here and you're coming here to ask me questions. And I would show them the scripture on certain things, you know, like dispensationalism, rightly dividing and stuff. They're like, oh, wow, I never saw it like that. Wow, you're right, you know, and so forth, you know. And the teachers, you know, they, they didn't teach that. It's very, most of their stuff is sour milk, if I could describe it. Sour milk. That's the best way I could describe it. There's milk and then there's sour milk. Sometimes they provide us some good milk and some of their milk is good. I liked it. But, but man, sometimes they would provide that sour milk, bro. Like, almost made me puke sometimes, you know. So, so that's sour what I'm saying. 
and I was like, man, they're they're just teaching surprising me little by little, you know, like teaching more heresy and more heresy, more heresy. And I sort of had the limit there where where the pastor, uh, well, a teacher, was speaking and basically uh, he was talking about what the pastor goes through and stuff, and that the pastor has full authority if he wants to like or get like a hundred thousand dollars off the ministry he can stop by the the lady and just get the check and nobody can ask him any questions and that's how it should be like what <laughs> you know and he can go ahead and if he wants to buy whatever like a new car they can't ask him any questions so i'm like yeah. that sounds like a cult man <laughs> that yeah. like a cult and, uh, and you gotta you've gotta understand if you're saved, your authority is the word of God. Yeah. And you go to church to be fed. What happens if you're going to church and they don't use the right Bible? Well, they're not feeding you the right milk. All right. The word of God is like milk. Where does milk come from? All right. My wife doesn't like it when I do this, but yeah, this is an illustration. Where does milk come from from a woman? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Milk comes from there. There's two of them. Yeah. There's Old Testament, New Testament. I find that interesting. Why God gave us yeah. two. Our God, well, men have them too, but God gave two. Now, yeah. do you want to go to a pure virgin or who was a virgin before she got married and, and, and who's clean and get clean milk? Or do you want to go to a whore? Yeah. You say, hey, whore, let me have your whore milk. Who knows what disease she has? You know, yeah. which, where would you want your milk from? A clean person or a dirty person? Well, yeah. the word of God is like milk. So the word of God, the pure word of God, King James, comes from the pure fountain, the pure. Yeah. It's, you know, I don't want to go to the whore and get the whore's milk. Yeah. And if you know Revelation chapter 17, then you know who the whore is. Yeah. So why are you using a translation from her, from the Pontifical Bible Institute of Rome, that is full of corruption and perversion? Yeah. You've got a bad milk. And so you go to church, you're supposed to be fed. Well, a lot of churches to, today are anemic. A lot of yeah. pastors today are anemic, and they're not teaching the Word of God. And when they do, it's milk sop. Yeah. I mean, the Bible talks about meat. I need the meat. Amen. So I go to the church, I want to get fed. I want meat. Yeah. It's like many churches today, they claim to be steakhouses, and you go there expecting to eat a steak, and they serve you warm buttermilk. I'm yeah. not going back to that steakhouse. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, so I've had to feed myself with the word of God through studying it myself and doing sermons every week. It helps me to study even more. The more I study, the, the more I grow in the Lord. But a lot of people, they all they do is go to church. They never read the Bible for themselves. Yeah. Well, no wonder there's so many anemic Christians and how sad that is. Yeah. So if we could get the pastors right, then people would get right. You know what I mean? But uh, we're starting to see many, many pastors that are just, um, going to the world, doing it the worldly way, going to the wrong Bible, going to the wrong gospel, going the way of tradition rather than scripture. And that's one of the things you saw because you read your Bible for yourself and you went to a, a very traditional Bible school and you saw them spewing out just tradition that you're just like, I can't take this. I can't digest this. It's making me vomit. Exactly. Because it's not Bible, it's tradition. Yeah. And I wish I could tell you all the things that I've seen. Many people don't understand that when I preached in 200 different churches, all the things that I saw from behind the, the scenes. And boy, I wish I could talk about it all. But it's just, it's sickening to see how sad that many people are who claim to be Christians and they're just playing religion. They don't know God from a watermelon. That's right. And they're ruining people's lives. And it, it bothers me. And they should be helping people and edifying them and building them up. Instead, they're abusing them. They're putting them down. They're lying to them. And sometimes it's on accident. Sometimes it's not purposeful. Sometimes it's just because they themselves are deceived. Why don't they get back in the Bible? And that's what's sad to me. I want to stick with the book and what the book says. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, you know, and that's sort of what, what I went through a little bit and you know, the Lord has showed me a lot of stuff from his precious word. And, you know, of course, I'm, I'm growing every day. And, you know, when it when it comes to that, you know, they they just need prayer. They, they need prayer and then they need to get right. They need to start teaching true doctrine, because sometimes, you know, people look at me weird when I'm talking about the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, you know, like I'm saying some new thing. I'm like, this ain't no new thing here. Just read, read the context. Look, look, what is it? I remember one time I was talking with a friend of mine. Uh, and basically he's supposed to be a senior 
and basically I start talking on how when the, once the rapture happens, the glorious, the most glorious thing will happen. It will be conformed to his image, to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll look precisely like him. We'll get a glorified body. And he's like, that's not true. And he's supposed to be a senior, a senior in a well-known college. He's like, that's not true. I'm like, what do you mean that's not true? It's in the Bible. And that's in Romans chapter 8. We'll be conformed to the image of his son. He's like, that's not true. I'm like, okay, then. All right. <laughs> you know, I just let it go. You know, it's just, it just shows the, the cause most, and I, and I'll say the word funny mentalist, cause that's what it is. A straight funny mentalist. And I don't say that to, to ridicule or take down nobody. That's just the pure, what it is. It's funny mentalism. It, it is what it is because they, they spew out sour milk all the time. It's always story, uh, sto uh, uh, stories for like little kids, you know, and may maybe they go to a passage of scripture from then on. No, no cross reference or nothing. They're just telling one big story and they'll go like that for one hour. And, you know, some of them, you know, I remember I was listening to preaching on, on a certain pastor and basically uh, the pastor was going, yeah, praise God, you know, and the whole message was him how on how he won people to Christ. And I went up to this guy and they wanted to Christ, led him to this prayer. Amen. He got saved. And I went to this other black guy over here and I went to a prayer. Amen. He got saved. You know, and, and the whole message was him boasting himself up on how he won people to Christ. And I'm like, dude, you only gave like one verse of scripture. And now it's Hebrews 12. that There's other people looking down in the great cloud of witnesses. And that's all he gave. The rest of the sermon was, hey, man, he got saved. Hey, man, hey, man. You know, and I'm like, just getting, it's like, 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 like a, like a pep rally. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's not, it wasn't a yeah. sermon. It was a pep rally you received like in an ele elementary school. I'm like, and you hear, and I heard the students are like, hey, man. <laughs> you know, what kind of. You know, many of those churches I've been to like that, they, they say, don't look down at your Bible, look up here at me. That's something that always bothered me. Like, what are you, an, yeah. an idiot? Don't Amen. look at my Bible. What kind of person says, don't look at your Bible? Yeah. Why do I have to look at you? Why can't I look at what God says and listen to you? What? Yeah. I mean, these are just horrible things. But let's go ahead and read this because you're a young man. And I saw this as a young man, too. And this was a verse that helped me. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all ex acceptation. I'm in uh, 1 Timothy 4, yeah. verse yeah. 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer approach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Any Calvinist verse there. Uh, yeah. These things command and preach. Now look what he says. And teach, excuse me. Let no man despise thy youth. You know, a lot of people, they look at you and you're young. They yeah. say, well, you can't possibly know anything, so I don't have to listen to you. I know better than you. Uh, age has nothing to do with it. It's how much of the Bible do you know? Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of believers, of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And one of the things we need to do is realize uh, there's two ways to deal with people. Mm -hmm. You can either be puffed up. The Bible says knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And you can, you know, talk down to them. <laughs> and then they'll never hear a word you have to say. So yeah. that's not the right way to do it. And yet that's how a lot of people do it. Or you can just say, oh, really? Is that what you think? Well, can you show me that in the Bible? My dad would always do that. My dad would always deal with people. And he'd always say, how about that? Well, well, the Bible says this right here, and you're saying this right here. How do you reconcile that when God says one thing and you're saying the other? Can you reconcile that for me? And that's yeah. how my dad would reach people. He wasn't condescending or mean or yelling or attacking. He would just literally say, all I want to know, you tell me. How is it that God says this and you say this and you yeah. want me to believe you instead of God? Come on. Tell me why I should believe you instead of God. No one can answer that. <laughs> yeah. And so if, if you can show them in the scripture that it says that, they have to understand you're arguing with God, not with me. I'm That's just right. here with him and what he said. You're over there. I just want to make that clear. You believe that. I believe what the Bible says. So, you know, can two walk together except they be agreed. But I have seen a lot of this stuff. And uh, that's one of the reasons why it's just so sad to me to see our world going the wrong way. And the problem is preachers. Preachers aren't preaching what they should. And they have compromised. And many of them have. And I could give you so many stories of so many things that I saw. And um, I'll give you a neat story here. I, I don't know if I've ever told these stories. But um, Ruckman, Dr. Peter Ruckman used to tell us in Bible school about, you know, what made him the way he was. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people didn't like Peter Ruckman. Let's be honest. He was yeah. critical, very critical. Unfortunately, he could have been a nicer person, but hey, 
people are who people are, and a, a, a true Christian learns to be long-suffering and overlook faults in others, okay? Yeah. But uh, Ruckman, he went to Bible school, and he went to Bob Jones University, and he sat there in Bible school, and he heard the teachers making fun of the King James Bible. And he sat there and said, no, they're not going to talk me out of my faith in this book. Amen. And he said, one of the teachers stood up, and one of the teachers said, now over there in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus and the rich man in hell, and Ruckman raised his hand and said, excuse me. And he said, yes, Dr. Ruckman. He says, you said in the parable. He says, that doesn't say it's a parable. That's right. That was the literal thing that literally took place. And that man said, Mr. Ruckman, do you speak Greek? He said, no, because he just started school. He says, then you don't know more than I do. So you shut up and it's whatever I say it is or something like that. And Ruckman just went, mm -hmm. and all these students were like, huh. you know, like, shut up. Teacher knows best. And he sat there and he swore to himself and to God. He said, I'm going to take Hebrew and I'm going to learn Greek. And I'm going to prove to this man that he is a lying, sorry rascal who yeah. does not believe in the word of God. And so Ruckman was only going to go to, to just take the teaching and preaching. He wasn't going to learn all that other stuff. He learned Greek. He learned Hebrew. As a matter of fact, he, he should have been the Hebrew teacher at Bob Jones University because yeah. his teacher, Brokenshire, they called him Old Brokey. Old Brokenshire died grading Ruckman's Hebrew page, and they found him dead at his desk, and he had written a note. This man should be teaching Hebrew because <laughs> Ruckman understood Hebrew so well. So Ruckman learned all the Hebrew and all the Greek, and every time they tried to go to the Greek. Now, there's no such thing as the Greek. Yeah. Amen. If anybody ever comes to you and says the King James Bible is wrong because the Greek says that is a liar and a heretic, Amen. and either they're lying on purpose, led by a devil probably, or they're ignorant and they don't know what they're saying. Yeah. Because there's no such thing as the Greek. There are many Greek texts. So when you say the Greek says, which one? The exactly. Texas Receptus says it right. What you're trying to do is go to that false Greek text, the corrupted yeah. one, and try to correct my King James. No, you, I'm not going to let you play that game. No. Um, you show me what the King James says because it came from the right text. I don't need to run to the Greek. But I took three years of Greek. I can do it. I don't want to. Um, we had we actually studied from the Nestle Island to see all the changes. And we can read the critical apparatus of the Nestle Island Greek text. And most Bible schools don't even teach that. And you can catch them in a lie. Lie after lie after lie in the notes of that Nestle Island. They just lie out their teeth. It's so sad. So new versions come from a bunch of scholars that are liars. And you can't help but see that. So don't say the Greek. When you're yeah. talking about the Greek, which one? The Texas Receptus or your critical text? False Greek text. But um, Ruckman learned all that, and he went to school there. And uh, Ruckman, at the end of, of school, in order to graduate, you have to write something. And it's called a thesis. And Ruckman said, I'm going to write my thesis about true Christians and false Christians. <laughs> and he went through all of church history, and he showed that the true Christians were usually country boys that didn't know much. That yeah. believed the Bible and got souls one. And that the false Christians were the ones sitting in the faculties of big schools who were attacking the Bible, who never won anybody to the Lord. That's right. And they were the scholars that were lying because they were not out on the front lines. They were in the backgrounds talking bad about it. Yeah. And when he finished his thesis on that, he, he basically said these scholarly types aren't even saved. When they read his paper, they're like, no, I'm not gonna, I refuse to give him a grade. Ruckman didn't get to graduate the year he should have graduated because they kept passing his thesis around, and it pricked them to the heart <laughs> so bad that they didn't want to read it. Now, he also, he talked about Calvinism, and many of his teachers were Calvinists. Yeah. He was butting heads with them. He's like, no, 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 no. I don't believe in Calvinism. When, when he went in to sit down, he sat before this board, and they asked them a question that no one is supposed to ever answer because it's so hard of a question. And they said, Mr. Ruckman, what happens if an irresistible force moves upon an immovable object? Because in Calvinism, you know, God's irresistible. Yeah. Uh -huh. And no one's ever answered it. And Ruckman goes, that's easy. It shatters. <laughs> and they're like, I never thought of that. I mean. It just, he was funny. And so there are all these high up muckety mucks thinking they're smarter than everybody else. They don't even believe that the Bible is the word of God. Amen. They think yeah. They're smarter than God. They think they're the final authority, not God in the King James Bible. 
and Ruckman was called into his, I think it was his Greek professor. Or, yeah. And he said, Ruckman comes in and he goes, yeah, yeah, what do you want? You know, and that's how Ruckman talks. He's like, yeah, what do you want? You call me in? And the Greek professor was looking out the window and he says, sit down, Ruckman. He goes, okay, let me sit down. He says, Dr. Ruckman. He says, oh, he wasn't a doctor at the time. He says, Ruckman, he says, I've spent my life studying Greek. I can tell you the second aorist active indicative of the third person plural. And I can, and he goes on and on. He goes, but I've never won a soul to Jesus Christ a day in my life. Mm-hmm. And Ruckman could see a tear running down his eye. And he says, get out, Ruckman, get out, get out. And Ruckman's like, what, what? He said, just get out. And, and, and you can see the conviction in the man because he wasted his life running to the Greek instead of just believing the book. And everyone at that school knew Ruckman was out on the street drawing and winning souls every week. Yeah. So Ruckman went through that at that school. And when he got out of that Bible school, he was like, man, these people are, are a piece of work. Many of them don't believe that the word of God is the final authority. They've been taught by that school that they're the final authority, not God. So that's why Ruckman was the way he was. And he always tried to stick up for the King James Bible. And that's what he's known for. And that's why we appreciate him. But he also, he could have been, I just say, he could have been nicer in the way he dealt with those people. (laughs) You know, instead of calling them names all the time, it could have been uh, these poor, deluded People that are deceived, they think this, but the Bible says this. I mean, that would have been better than a bunch of pug nose cross-eyed or upper baits. I mean, they're so crooked, you throw them through a barrel of fish hooks, they don't get stuck one time. They're crooked as a dog's hind leg. I mean, I learned how to use Christian cussing through reading Ruckman's books. You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, I think the best way is not to come across as condescending or as critical, but as, okay, you say that. All right. The Bible says the opposite. Now, Prove to me that God is wrong. Yeah. Go ahead. Show me. And when, you can't argue with God. And so there's a way to deal with people in which they will hear you. But also you can't reason with an unreasonable man. And so oftentimes you'll come across people that are unreasonable and will not accept truth. And that's what's so sad. But uh, I rep- appreciated Ruckman. He's one of the greatest Bible teachers in the world. Yeah. Amen. Um, I agree. With but also he, he had a lot of filler in his in his. Uh, um, commentaries. My dad went down to the Dominican Republic and won my uncle to the Lord. Well, actually, no, he won him to the Lord here. And my dad went down and visited my uncle because my dad sent my uncle all of Ruckman's commentaries, all of them. My uncle was a super smart man, very smart, very high IQ. And my dad said he went down and, and said, well, I see all of Ruckman's commentaries. He goes, yeah, I've read them all through five or ten times. And my dad says, well, what do you think of Ruckman? He goes, oh, he's pretty shallow. That's <laughs> like the greatest Bible teacher probably in, in our modern time. And you think he's shallow? And he goes, yeah. And then he goes, why? He goes, well, we'll take this page, for instance. Three, four quarters of the page is this lamb blasting people. And one quarter of it is teaching Bible. If you could just take all that out and just put in the good Bible teaching, yeah. it'd be better. Well, so that's one of the things that Ruckman did is he, he was the man. And I guess he, he yeah. just... Talk, spoke like a man, but I don't want to waste words, you know, and I don't want to put people down. I want to edify. And so I want to do that. And uh, it, it just was kind of funny. I went to the bookstore, Ruckman's bookstore one time. And Ruckman had just put out his commentary on First Corinthians. And yep. there was a man at the bookstore named Skip. And Skip was amazing. He was such a nice fella. And just such a nice fella. Matter of fact, the Bible that I use was Skip's Bible. I bought it from him. And uh, that's my Bible that I still have. I Skip bought it and said, oh, the print's too small. And he sold it to me. I still have a couple of his notes in it. And so um, I bought that Bible from Skip. And I walk into the bookstore and Skip goes, did you get Ruckman's new commentary on 1 Corinthians? I said, no. He goes, come here. And he's looking around. He starts talking real quiet like he didn't want people to hear what he was saying. And I said, you know, he goes, it's really good, Brother Breaker. He goes, he doesn't call names or anything. He just teaches the Bible. <laughs> I was like, well, hey, man, I guess I'll have to get it. So even people that followed him were like, you know, why did he waste words and talking about how bad these people were instead of just sticking with teaching the Bible? Yeah. And uh, I think he would have had a further reach if he'd done that. But I'm not going to judge him, you know. Um, but I do appreciate him teaching the Bible and standing for the word of God. Yeah, but, I, believe, um, um, I believe, you know, the Lord uses people who are different he uses them his own way like for example there's an old i think it was a methodist preacher i'm not sure peter cartwright i don't know if you've ever heard of him oh well i have heard of peter cartwright yeah he was crazy you know he he 
he he chased the guy out of church service and ran after him and he jumped over a fence and followed him and he's screaming at him you know god's dealing with you and then he <laughs> Top of the guy and is slapping him. Don't you feel the Holy Spirit of God deal with you to get saved? And then the guy supposedly got saved. I mean, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> well, but, I believe you know the Lord has uses. There's people because me personally, I'll never do that. You know, and I'll never you know. Me neither. Me neither. Yeah. Me so, but I believe the Lord uses people differently. You know, if if someone has that character, I believe the Lord will use that type of character. And you know, for example, someone can look at us. And they can say, well, you guys are a bunch of cowards. You don't say the names or nothing, you know, and people will say that. But no, that's just how I am. Well, that's just to me, it says speak evil of no man. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So so we're we're uh, my point is, yeah, we're, we're all different. I mean, God uses everyone, I guess, differently. And the case with Dr. Ruckman, I, I mean, I like his commentaries. I mean, I'm his con I'll be honest with you, man. His commentaries make me laugh. I learn Bible and I bust out laughing every single time. I got a good sense right. of humor, so it just goes good with me, you know. But I know some people don't like him, and you know what? That that's okay, that's fine, you know. Because at the end, very end of the day, you know, a Christian is someone who follows after Christ, you know, not any other man. Uh, Doctor Ruffman once mm -hmm. made this statement, and you know, this statement, you know, if you apply it to today, is like wow. He made the statement that uh, Pastor Robinson from from the Mayflower, where he went to go doing a trip or something, he made the statement where. Pastor, Pastor Robinson said that Luther and Calvin were great shining lights of their day. But the Lutherans have stopped with Luther and the Calvinists have stopped with Calvin. I am sure that God is able to reveal more from his precious word. Now, having said that, I will make the statement. Dr. Ruckman, without a doubt, was one of the best Bible teachers of all time. He was a great shining light of his day. He's he's the only one you've seen the front lines for a long time pushing for the King James Bible. But the sad part is, is that the Ruckmanites have stopped with Ruckman. Hmm. I tell you that God is able to reveal more from his precious word. Amen. Amen. And I agree. And so. Uh, Rugman always taught us, you know, uh, it starts with a man, then becomes a movement, then a machine, yeah. and then, you know, and things like that. So uh, I, I don't want to be a man follower. When I started my YouTube channel preaching, I went out of my way not to tell people where I went to Bible school. And I think they connected the dots. So, you know, I, I am not ashamed of where I went to Bible school. I don't know if they're ashamed of me. Who cares? I, I'm not here to please man. I'm here to please the Lord. And I thank God for the foundation that they laid. And uh, I just hit the ground running and I uh, want to be what the Lord would have me to be. And I don't want to be um, group think. Uh, yeah. When I was on deputation, I found every time I'd go to a church, they'd say, what group are you in or what camp are you in? And what they meant was what Bible school did you go to? Did you go to Tennessee Temple? Did you go to Crown College? Did you go to uh, Pacific Coast? Did you go to PBI? Did you go to PCC? Did you go to Bob Jones? Did you go to, you know, and, and if you weren't, their group they kind of went up oh, and they and they shunned you or which man did you follow did you follow ruckman or did you follow hiles or did you follow uh roloff or did you follow and and it i always had a bad taste in my mouth so they'd ask me what what uh camp are you in brother breaker and i'd look at every one of them i'd say i'm without the camp with jesus amen that's amen because that's what the bible says jesus suffered without the camp but i don't need to be in any camp I'm without the camp with Jesus, and I'm happy just to be with him. I don't need you. Oh, uh, well, you know, you know what I meant. No, no. You just want to fellowship with me based upon who you follow. Mm. How about we fellowship because we're saved and we love the book? Amen. Some of them didn't love the book. Some of them didn't love the King James Bible. And I, I had to get away from some of them. And uh, so I've always wanted, I've always been kind of a maverick that did things on my own. And uh, some people today, they don't like me. They say things about me that aren't true because I think, honestly, they made assumptions about me and they assumed I was something that I wasn't <laughs> or that I was connected with someone that I wasn't connected with. Yeah. Well, fine. You can think whatever you want, but that word assume, just just be careful. Yeah. The first three letters <laughs> makes that out of you and me. When you That's assume. right. Okay. That dad taught me that. Assume me. All right. You and me are becoming, you know what? It makes yeah. a point of you and me. If you don't know the truth and you you think I'm something I'm not, so you need to be careful assuming things about other people. But uh, there's a lot more I could get into on that. But 
like I said, I'm just so thankful that God's used me over the years in Honduras to start two churches and see your soul saved there. God's used me as a missionary evangelist, and God's used me on YouTube. I get all the time people saying, I got saved watching your videos, Brother Breaker, and I just say, praise the Lord. So I'm anxious to go to heaven and see all those people that are that are there because of my ministry. And I'm not interested in debating or fighting or attacking other people uh, or listening to what they say about me that's not even true. And I find it so sad that within the Ruckmanite camp that yeah. now they're split and there was a church split and things like that. And now there's some that believe pre-trib rapture, like I still do, and others that don't. Others that think there's only three and a half years left and things like that. So it's kind of sad. It's kind of sad. But, um, you know, I, I literally lost two years of my ministry because I cared about what people thought about me. And I went around in the dumps for a long time. It just felt like, oh, nobody cares and they hate me. And my dad, he just kept going, why do you care about what they think? Don't you care about what God thinks? Yeah. And that really lifted me up because I'm not here doing what I do for them. If they want to help me, praise the Lord, and I'll help them if, as long as they're doing right. But I don't need to live my life wondering, did I please man? Yeah. <laughs> All I care about is, did God, is he pleased with me? And uh, so I'm I'm happy. And, oh, somebody says, you slanderer. <laughs> okay, I don't know if that's the content. Isn't it funny how they always love to call names and things like that? Yeah, and you liar. And you, okay, I think somebody's having a little private chat. But it's funny how they say things about you, and they're not true. And so it's like, huh, okay, well, I know I sleep well at night because I know God knows what's true. Amen. So I'm happy with that, and I'll leave it with that. And I'm not trying to hurt anyone or anyone's ministry. Yeah. I don't go around talking about others and putting them down because I believe God can use anybody. So if God can still use them in their ministry, the last yeah. thing I ever do is talk bad about them. Amen. Yeah. Even if I know things about them, <laughs> yeah. I think the best thing to do is just keep quiet and say, they've got their ministry. I've got mine. I'll pray for them. Hope the best. And I wish they'd pray for me. But uh, I'm just so tired of false doctrine, tired of tradition, tired of attacks. But it's all worth it when somebody gets saved. I mean, if that's what it takes for somebody to get saved, well, then bring it on. Amen. Because that's what it's all about. Because in heaven, there won't be none of that. And we'll all be happy. Amen. So, praise the Lord for that. But we wanted to talk about tradition today and let people see. And in all churches, there's tradition. People contact me all the time, say, I can't find a good church. Then they find a church. And at first, it sounds like they're teaching right and they're doing right. But then they see some of that false doctrine or tradition. And they say, what do we do? And I tell people, as, as long as you can, stay there until it grieves your spirit so much that you can. And then if it's time to move on, move on. People say, why did you start the cloudchurch.org? Because people all over the world don't have a good church to go to. Yeah, that's right. I wanted to be faithful every week, bringing a new church uh, sermon in English and Spanish and uh, help them. And uh, I, I'm trying to. And a lot of people are encouraged because it's hard to find good churches. Yeah. And the devil is going to do everything he can to shut them down. Now, there's still some good ones out there. There's still some Bible schools out there that are good. What is the Bible school that you're going to now? Can we ask about that? And if someone wants to go there, how do they do that? Well, I mean, it's it's one of the best Bible schools I've been to. It's, uh, it's called the Bible Doctrine Institute. Okay. Uh, it's it's an online Bible school, and, you know, it's, it's uh, done. The dean is, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, David Walker. I think he's involved with it. I think he's the, the dean there. And, and I'm trying to remember... David, David Peacock, he's one, he's a really good Bible teacher. I listen to some of his stuff, and you know he's I think he's in charge of that school, and it's a really good school. I, I'm enjoying the curriculum. I I am. It's Bible believing content, you know? and it's through the internet, so anybody can go to it through the internet. What's their website so people might know? Uh, Td uh, org, or just type mm -hmm. in the, yeah tdbi org or the Bible Doctrine Institute. Org. Okay. A lot of people want to me to start a Bible school. That's something I'm praying about. And if that happens, we'll praise the Lord. I honestly don't know where to begin, but yeah. I would definitely like to do that. It would have to be all online and all by itself. Like you go through, take the questions and then it grades it. It would have to be all that because I'm so busy, but um, I already have a lot of videos and um, we've talked about perhaps, you know, you've got some videos you can make and other things. 
Yeah. And I would love for that to happen. I just, I wonder if the Lord's coming back first. And if so, that's fine. But it just seems like every week now, someone's saying, hey, well, how do I go to Bible school? When are you going to start a Bible Institute, Brother Breaker? Oh, well, pray about that and then we'll see what happens. But if you'll watch all my videos, that's like a Bible Institute in itself. And if you'll get Clarence Larkin's book, Dispensational Truth, that's like a Bible Institute in and of itself. And time is short and people need to get out there. Uh, people asked about the Ruckman, Ruckman's reference Bible. Oh, that's uh, when, we were in, when we were in school, Ruckman said he's never going to do that. Oh, and then yeah. all of a sudden, then it comes out. And for people I know personally, it, it sounded like some of those notes may not all have been his. I'll just leave it at that in order for them to finish it. So I got one. I read through it. I was like, eh. You know what I liked better? The Common Man's Reference Bible by David oh, Hoffman. Yeah, that's the I was first very yeah. impressed with Brother Hoffman. I preached for him one time. Funny story. He was pastoring two churches. One in was one in Indiana and the other in Illinois or something. I, I forget. It was two different states. And uh, there was a twin in each one of those churches that sat in the same spot. So when you come in and you're preaching the pulpit, you see the same face. When you go to preach in the other pulpit, you saw the same face. They were brothers. I thought that was so funny. But uh, I met him, I liked him, and I really like his his Bible, the wide margins, everything. Yes, yeah, it's The Common Man's Bible by David Hoffman. And he's I a highly writer. recommend that. That reference yeah. Bible has so many references in there that he did not even think of. It's probably even references. I right. Call it. right. They're taken right. straight because Dr. Ruckman in his commentary, you know, he would hear what he thinks and he'll give you the references for it. I think what David Hoffman did is that he saw that and he slapped that right in the center column reference. So whenever you're reading your Bible on something like, let's say, you know, uh, in Genesis 3 and Genesis 315, where it says, it, it, the, it shall bruise the head and thou shalt bruise his heel, uh, uh, thy seed and your seed, the enmity between thy seed, their most references won't go to the seed of the serpent. So what I like what David Hoffman does, he actually has a letter E there. I think it's letter E on the seed of the serpent because the serpent has a seed. He does, but most Bible commentators like, oh, you know, they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and I says, you don't like the Ruckman Reference Bible? I didn't say that. I just said, no, no, I, Ruckman Reference Bible is amazing. Uh, common ones, a little, in my estimation, I like it better. But um, there's a lot of good things in the Ruckman Reference Bible. Okay, I'm not putting it down. You got to be careful nowadays how you speak. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> People are like, well, do you hate it? No. Yeah. But I do, um, I do find some things in the Ruckman Reference Bible that are like, what? And so I just, I wonder, toward toward the end, Ruckman said some things a little differently than he did before. And I'll just say it because I don't care. I mean, <laughs> I just want people to know the truth. There was young Ruckman and old Ruckman. Yeah. And young, young Ruckman preached it hard, preached it straight, faith in the blood, preached it right. As he got older, he started to say things a little bit differently. Yeah. And yeah. even to this day, I see people that follow old Ruckman and, you know, try to throw things against you. It's like, you didn't know the man that my dad and I knew. Uh, my dad went there and uh, I went there and he preached hard on the blood atonement of Christ in his early years. So, yeah, it's one of those things. Let's see why I don't like to get into arguments and things like that. Yeah. I don't really even want to talk about. But this was so important that we understood that tradition can make the word of God a non effect. And there's a lot of people that are starting a tradition and oftentimes they'll start something good and it can go bad. Other times they start something good and it continues good. Um, yeah. There was one called, uh, down in Chicago, there was a place called the um, Pacific Garden Mission. And I remember going there years ago, back in the 90s, and I just wandered in to see the place. And they set me down, and they gave me the most clear presentation of the gospel that I've ever heard in my life. And then they ended with Romans 3.25. And I was like, praise the Lord. Wow. And I said, well, man, I'm already saved, but if I wasn't, man, thanks for showing me that, because then I could have yeah. got saved. But people have gone there lately, and some charismatics have taken over mm. and it's not the same place. But for something like 100 years, it was good. So everything tends to apostasy. Everything goes down and apostatizes is what we were taught in school. And that's sad. It's so sad that things happen. So always stick with the right foundation and don't go into that tradition. Amen. And this is what I see. And, and again, I could care less what people <laughs> that, that, that yeah. are Rockman fans think. But this is what I saw when we went to school. Ruckman said three things in our orientation. He said, number one, the most important thing is your relationship with Jesus Christ. So make sure you stay close to him. Excellent advice. Number two, you're not me. So don't act like me. Yeah. 
excellent advice. I saw a lot of guys, they graduated and then they pretend to be him and, and try to talk like him and act yeah. like him. I'm, I'm like, no, I'm who I am. So I'm just going to be myself. But it just, yeah. I always, I always saw that it kind of, and then he said, watch out for so-and-so who was a, dis, a hyper dispensationalist. So he warned us about a, a certain fellow that was a hyper dispensationalist and not to go into hyper dispensationalism. But uh, he taught us that. And um, let's see, where was I going with that? What was I going to say? So Ruckman taught us, you know, be ourselves and not be like him. Oh, it was so important too. I was going to get to it. What was it here? Um, but a lot of things that Ruckman taught us were great. And I remember that. But, oh, man, maybe it'll come back to me. I forgot. But I was going to tell you something that I was going to say that, that I thought was really important. Uh, but you don't have to be Peter Ruckman. And That's a lot right. of people want to be him. And they want that caustic, the critical thing. They want to be, you don't have to be like that. And uh, yeah. some of the best uh, brothers in Christ were those that, that weren't like him, but that went to school. And then there was other brothers that went to school there and they got depressed and discouraged and they, they gave up on the Lord. And that was, that was sad too, to see. Man, I'll, maybe I'll remember what I was going to say. I hate that. It's getting late anyway. Yeah. But I learned a lot from Ruckman and I appreciate all that he taught us. And, um, he was always Ruckman to everybody, you know, Ruckman. And he was funny. He was really funny too. Yeah. Very hard to, to approach and talk to in many ways because he was always so busy, always so busy. But he had a heart for evangelism and he loved preaching in jails and things like that. And uh, did I tell you the Billy Graham story? No, I don't think, uh, what, um, Billy Graham, I know some, some things about him. So Ruckman was at school at... Bob Jones and Billy Graham came to the school to preach one time, Bob oh, Jones University. And they told all the students, they told the students, they said, uh, this is for the people of the town to come and hear. So students can't come listen to Billy Graham. And Ruckman was upset. He wanted to hear Billy Graham. So he was in the radio ministry. He snuck up and hid like up in the rafters where they have like their lights and stuff. So he could hear Billy Graham preach. And uh, while Billy Graham was there on campus, he asked everybody, where's Ruckman? Where's Ruckman? I mean, just like calling him out. And they kept going, uh, Ruckman, Billy Graham wants to talk to you. He goes, ah, whatever, I don't care, whatever, whatever. And, and then finally, Billy Graham comes to talk to him and says, hey, I like how you draw. He said, would you come and open up my meetings with a chalk talk before I preach? And Ruckman's like, ah, whatever, I'll pray about it, ah, whatever. And it never did. But isn't that wild that Billy Graham asked him to do that? Um, we we both know Billy Graham was not. Yeah. I I sometimes Billy Graham, the early Billy Graham, preached a good message, didn't he? Yeah. First Corinthians fifty one through four. Never told him to trust the blood though, and that's kind of bothersome. And now this new guy, Franklin Graham, I wanted to record it because I wanted to play it here, and I didn't have a chance. But there's this thing that comes on Fox News, and it's like thirty seconds long, and it's the Reverend. I don't like using the term Reverend because yeah. Jesus, holy and reverend is his name. That's not, right. Amen. But the, the, the so-called Reverend Franklin Graham t gets up and he tries to tell you the gospel and tell you how to get saved. And he says, Jesus shed his blood for you. I'm like, yeah. And then he says, now repeat this prayer after me. Now, if you prayed that prayer, you're going to heaven. And it's just like, you don't get it, do you? You're trying to get people to go away from faith alone in the blood. It, yeah. A lot of people are going to be tricked into believing in their prayer rather yeah. than trusting in the blood. It's just they don't see. I, I don't see how they can miss it. Do you? I just don't see how they can miss it. Again, you know, it it, it comes from, you know, just the concept of it. The, the reason why they do it is because they want to make sure that the person is saved. You know, that's why. But here's the thing. You're not God. <laughs> you're not God. You can't hear their salvation because they can pray and they can never believe, you know. Right. So, they can believe without praying. And yeah. so it, it, the problem with many people today that claim to be soul winners, and I call a lot of them soul wieners because they don't do it right. They uh, they go to a center and they want to see with their eyes something outward. And then they'll proclaim them safe because I outwardly saw this. Yeah. Well, I saw you repeat the prayer outwardly. So because I saw it, it but you don't see the heart. God right. sees the heart. We just see the mouth. And you can say something with the mouth and not believe it in the heart. Yeah, I mean, yeah. one day we were out knocking on doors while I was in Bible school and this guy went with me and door open and the guy opens the door and he has the door open with his hand back here like this. He says, I'd like to tell you, well, the Bible says you're a sinner and 
Jesus died for you. And uh, look at this. Just call upon the name of the Lord. You'll be safe. So will you repeat a prayer with me? And the guy goes, well, if you get out of here faster, I'll do it. And he goes, okay, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please save me. Amen. Lord, I'm a sinner. Please. Amen. And he goes, okay, well, you're saved. And the guy goes, well, good. And he pulls a beer out. And he goes, now get the blank out of here. Goop, goop, goop. And he goes back in the house. Yeah. Did that guy get saved? How no, he wanted us to leave. And so he's like, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it if you'll get the blank out of here after. Yeah. And yet people are so sad to think that, no, that guy got saved. It's like, yes, no, no, no. That guy just wanted you to leave because you were a pesky vacuum salesman. And that's he wanted right. you to, so he could get back to his party in there. You know what I mean? And so that's what a lot of people don't understand. It's a heart matter. And it's not just saying something with your mouth. It's whether you're believing from the heart. Yeah. And, uh, that's important. That's very important. Um, so many other things that I could say. Um, I don't. I don't want to make this all about Rockman, though. And, no, no, uh, I understand. And a, lot of, a lot of people like him, so they want to know more. And yes, my dad knew him pretty well, and things like that. And we we know people that. Well, you know, he was in a wreck one time. His car stalled on a on a railroad track, and it and it hit. And Rockman almost died. That was funny, or sad actually. But it was funny because we met the guy. <laughs> he met him and he told us, you know, that was my car that, that Ruckman was in. I was like, oh, my goodness, really? So uh, we grew up here. I did in Milton, which is across the bay from Pensacola. Yeah. So it's been wonderful for me to have that just up the, not far from us. A lot of people come down here and complain about, oh, I had to leave my job to go to Bible school. It's like, well, if you don't like it, leave, you know, but I, I like it. I'm from here. This is this is home. Yeah. But, you know. I was really blessed. I count myself really blessed to have um, learned a lot. And um, I'm thankful that now I can go serve the Lord. And I appreciate all that the Lord has done for me. And I appreciate all those over there at that school and everything like that. And I do pray for them often. Yeah. But the one thing Dr. Rutman told us, and this is something I've always thought of and tried to, to remember, um, was talking about piggybacking off of someone's ministry. Oh, yeah. And uh, he warned about how people try to piggyback off of someone's ministry. And that's what they tried to do to Ruckman. This guy wrote a book. You remember the guy that wrote the book, King James Onlyism or whatever his name was, Stuart Custer. Was that his name? Uh, and, King uh, Controversy. Um, okay. Yeah, that must be it. James and, White. Uh, James yeah. White. Well, there's another one too. I think it was Custer that wrote a book also. Maybe, what are they yeah. doing? They're just using a guy's name to try to make a bigger ministry for themselves. Yeah. And that's something I've never wanted to do. And that's why I went out of my way not to mention who he was, you know, where I went to Bible school. Um, just want to preach and teach the book and uh, let God um, move in however way he wants. And I'm so thankful for people and get have gotten saved and things like that. Amen. But uh, Ruckman's warned about piggybacking. So that's why I don't do a lot of live streams in case people are wondering, because I'm not trying to piggyback off of the ministry of somebody else. Yeah, and I'm very, very cautious of others trying to piggyback off of my ministry and uh, just wanting to get on and say, we want to be on there so, you know, people can watch us, too. I have to be very careful because I don't want to have somebody on that ends up being messed up later. Yeah. And now they've gone into false doctrine. So I had Brother um, Roy on. I think he's OK. Yeah, he's a blessing. I had others on. I think they're pretty good. So don't let me down, guys. <laughs> Don't become traditionalist into that system. Stick with teaching the book. Amen. Yeah. And, uh, but I do want other Christians to be able to realize there are other true Christians out there. And we need to stick together. And we don't need to, to be in camps, if you will. We yeah. need to just love each other in the Lord. And and it's just so sad how they all divide and they just don't talk to each other anymore. And uh, if, if ever we needed to get along, it's now because we're so close to the Lord coming back. I believe the rapture is so close, man. Like just with everything going on in my life and just, you know, just how this world, how bad this world is going. Like I, just the other day I saw this video where, where basically they were having drag queens come in and do presentation in front of the whole church. Mm -hmm. Drag queens come in. I'm like, wow, man. Wow. You know, and they, they allow the whole thing and it's just perversion, sexual perversion, yeah. sickness. The the Ruckman used to say this, that it's going to get so bad that the whole world is going to be under the Antichrist in that religious system, which will be Rome heading it because yeah. Rome is the king of it. And when they do the mass, which they say is blood, they will literally be drinking blood. 
Yeah. And he had it to where they were drinking the blood of those that were beheaded for Christ. Yeah. So, and that's so far fetched. But now with everything we're seeing, it's like, yeah, I can see how the world can become that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that's what pagan rituals were. And that's what Satanism is. Um, many, many years ago, and I hate to admit it, I watched a, a thing called Faces of Death. I think there was part one, two, three, and four. I don't know what and that is. This series on VHS about it, it was video showing people that actually died, and uh, it was just it was it was sadistic. It was awful. I, I didn't want to watch it, but they showed some sort of a satanic ritual in which they they do satanic rituals by having orgies after having a human sacrifice and smearing the blood all over themselves. That to me is utterly disgusting. That's nasty. But can you see? that happening in churches in i i i'm love. so afraid of it. like here's the thing like i don't want it to happen but like just by how what i can see is going on like around like give it 30 years or something and I, 30 months or less is the way i look at it i, I mean yeah, we're almost there are, yeah i believe that it's so close man like everyone because when you encounter someone who professes like daily in your daily life someone who professes to be a christian usually they're not saved usually usually now of course there's exceptions i'm not saying that everyone you encounter is not saved but the people i've encountered you know waitresses because sometimes you know we uh, uh, me and my mom whenever we go out to eat we try to witness to the waitress and etc and you know they oh i'm a christian i'm fine you know and you know and maybe they don't have too many tables and sometimes we sit down you know we talk with her and stuff and, right. and they and, and she and us well you know i was baptized here so i'm good and i'm all set you know the smile on their face and i'm like oh boy you know <laughs> you know and i try to you know and i and, and you know another table is calling her so we just give her a track and say please read this your 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 life might depend on it you know so so yeah just the normal people encountering they have a mentality where it's just love 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 everyone come together you know and you know they go to the passage where it says god is love but they ignore the context god is love yeah where where does this show me love where do you find the love of god you find it at the cross of calvary exactly that's where you find the love See, of god that's that's how they'll twist it ruckman used to say they talk about love 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 well in the 60s it was free love fornication yeah. So they're going to say the highest form of worship, the highest form of love is just love each other in free love. And Jesus loved us, so he died for us. Oh, yeah. so if we love someone, we'll sacrifice them. And that's paganism. They sacrifice to their false gods, their children, because they love their demonic false gods. Yeah. And we can't fathom that today because that's disgusting to us. But that was the mindset for 6,000 years of pagans. And we're almost there again. And yeah. they're going to murdering people in a religious setting and probably drinking their bloods and orgies and claiming that they love one another and it's all because of love sick man and so that's something ruckman got right right there now a lot of people don't know that ruckman's bookstore is kjv1611.org and you can yeah. go there it still exists there's a lot of good books that you can get from there as well and ruckman's apocalypse my friend uh, travis dempsey uh put on youtube uh, a lot of good music too um Ruckman's Apocalypse, so you can watch that. Yep, there's the book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, and a lot of his. The his disc. Papers. This is. I have the book and the disc version. This is the disc version. Okay. Right. Now I'll be doing the Book of Revelation soon. Just wait, hang on there. I'm going to take a week or two off from, from right, teaching right. verse by verse. Then we'll start our verse by verse Bible uh, teaching. So pray for that. Amen. Uh, so. Huh, we didn't come on to talk about Ruckman, but you and I both, we love Ruckman because yeah. of his Bible teaching and his sticking with the King James. So, But um, at the same time, you know, we are our own men who love the Lord. Yeah. And, Amen. and I like what you said about, you know, Revelation and God is still showing us things as we yeah. get closer to him. Amen. And so we need to do that. Well, I was going to take questions, but we've got two hours now. So I hate to, uh, to do any questions uh, because... <laughs> There's not much time left. So go ahead and tell us anything else you want to talk about, Fabriel. I mean, just basically, just to summarize everything, you know, tradition as a whole has has overthrown America. You know, we're we're traditional people. We're people of customs. And, of course, America is the people's rights. That mirrors Laodicea. And, you know, that's currently right now where we're at. You know, and sometimes I, you know, I joke around sometimes. I say, you know, what's the best form of government? 
you know, I told this to a buddy of mine some time ago. I said, it's a monarchy. He's like, what? No. I'm like, wait a second. Let me finish. Let me finish. Not just any king. Because if it's just some other king, yeah, it's going to be a mess. I agree with you. But, man, if you get the Lord Jesus Christ on on, on that throne of David right there, sitting in Jerusalem, dude, it's going to be awesome. We're going to have a good time. You know, we're going to be serving the Lord. We're going. It's going to be great. You know, that's a monarchy. That's the monarchy I want, you know. So, Amen. Amen. Because this world is just so corrupt with its own traditions and everything, the customs. And we went through the scripture on that. And people are just so narrow minded. You know, they don't want to, you know, be open minded and say, hey, you know, what does the Bible say? Hey, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do research on these traditions, where they come from. You'll find out they come from pagan origins. Yeah. Most of them do. So, yeah. They don't Someone wanna... says something uh, here about Final Fight Bible Radio. Do you listen to Final Fight Bible Radio? Yeah, I, I, I like them. I, I I like their stuff. You know, it's it's really good. I, I I enjoy it. You know, it's it's good. It's better than most other radio stations. Uh, if I had to recommend any radio station, I would recommend Final Fight Bible Radio. It's really good. Well, amen, amen. Uh, what else? I wish I could think of some other things. I just it's too late for questions. It's getting late. I need to get to bed, man. But um, someone, yeah, uh, Valerie is asking, do you have a website or a channel or something? Yeah, I got a YouTube channel, uh, KJB Believers. That's okay. uh, capital K, capital J, capital B, not V, but B, as in breaker. KJB uh, Space Believers. I got a couple of videos there. I upload my. Uh, my progress on street preaching and do some sermons and some bible studies as well uh today uh i'm yesterday i already uploaded a video on those who believed and believe not you know just a little sermon there and and today you know um uh, i just finished you know working on a video here and i'll be uploading that today so yeah just okay. KJ believers. yeah i guess hablar en espanol you got to do some stuff in spanish too i don't so know I don't no sé, maybe. Okay. Pues estás en otro país ahí, en Miami. <laughs> es otro, otro estado. Solo español en todos lados. Okay. Well, I don't know, honestly, what else to say. I'm out of verses and out of things to say, except uh, I'm just so thankful for the truth. Amen. To yeah. know the truth and to know what the Bible says is true. And to not sit around and wonder, oh, do I know the truth or don't I? In the King James Bible, we know we have the Word of God. And uh, I, will, I guess that's a good place to stop. Second Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Yeah. And um, if you don't study and know the truth, then someday, if not now, you'll be ashamed. And you ought to be ashamed. You ought to be ashamed if you don't know the truth. And you need to get in that book and study because Fabriel has, and he's not that old. <laughs> Yeah, yet he has a lot of Bible knowledge because he's been through it and he's taken advantage of things like my videos and Ruckman's videos and other people's and he's studied and uh, that's what we need to do. We need to learn as much as we can and uh, stop wasting time, redeeming the, the time for the days are evil. Amen. And, um, as much as you can learn the Bible, learn the truth and get it out to others. It's one thing to know it all up here, but it's another thing to saying it out here Yeah, because if you just keep it to yourself. How's anyone edified? That's right. Um, yeah. To him, is given much is required. That, exactly. That verse always stuck with me. That's sort of what convicted me to start up that, that YouTube ministry. Because I was thinking to myself, how many people are like me, you know, who are searching for truth and they can't find it, you know? And they're, they're yeah. out there on the internet and maybe they're getting caught up in some heresy. How many people are just like me? That's sort of what motivated me to... To start up that channel because i just want to reach out to people who just are like were like me that are just trying to look for the truth and they want scripture for it because one thing i didn't like about most other teachers is that they'll 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 reference one point of scripture but but they won't do any cross references or nothing and you sort of got to take their word for it and it took me a long time that sort of stunted my growth because there are some teachers that were saying the truth you know, once saved, always saved. Amen. You know, uh, salvation is forever, dispensationalism stuff. But and and sometimes I wouldn't believe them because they would use so little scripture. You know, but when I went to your channel, I remember one of the first videos I saw when you were teaching dispensationalism. You had like you were wearing like like headphones and stuff, and you had a piece of paper and stuff, and you're like, 
dispensationalism is real. And you went through the verse, like over 20 verses or something over. And I'm like, whoa, you know, I'm like, wow. Okay. So this guy really knows his stuff. All right. Okay. <laughs> you know, so, and same thing with Dr. Ruckman, you know, he, he would always like do cross references all the time. And it's just scripture with him. Like every, every time he would speak, you would, he would always mention one or two cross references in his commentaries. That's why I like his commentaries because yes, you know, he writes what he thinks about it. Sure. But, he has some scripture to back that up and I like to check out the scripture and I'm like, wow. Yeah, you know, you're right. You know, so, so and it's the same thing with you, you know, you have scripture to back it up. And of course, even the enemy has scripture to back it up, but if it's not in context and I like what you guys do, you guys put it in context and rightly divide it too. So yeah, that's sort of what clarified. It opens up the Bible. Dispensationalism opens up the Bible. Many people hate dispensationalism. As you said, no, oh, it started with Darby in the 1800s. No, you have people back church fathers uh, back in the 300s teaching a pre-tribulation rapture in yep. the year 300 from that day and you're like what you know so the term dispensationalism okay I'll, that term the name itself as a package okay came around 1800 but the teaching it's in of them themselves dispensations of uh, pre-tribulation rapture those teachings go way back way back all darby did was take those things and put it in a package that's all he did you know, and many people get confused, and it's sad. They'll believe something, a heresy that started with, I think it was Rosenthal. Rosenthal was uh, was a person who believed in a pre-wrath rapture or something like that. Yeah, the pre-wrath rapture by Rosenthal. Yeah. Around what, like 1900s? When was that? Well, Rosenthal's book came out in the 1990s. Yeah. They'll listen to something that came out in the 1990s that no other person has ever thought of. But when you go back to the early thinkers of the day, the early Bible believers, they were teaching, hey, yeah, it's a pre-tribulation rapture. We're, we're caught out of here before the rapture starts because they were Bible believers. That's why. But, you know, then you start getting messed up in that nonsense. And the same people will say, well, dispensationalists started, started with Darby. Darby 1800 are the same people who go go back to the 90s, 1990s, you know, to, to teach their pre-wrath garbage, you know. <laughs> so, so yeah. it's contradiction, man. Well, amen. Well, one thing we need to realize is we're not alone. There's others out there. And yeah. I don't know how many we had. How many we had? We had uh, 451 watching right now. I don't know how many have been watching all the time. But there are others out there that believe like we do. And we don't want to fall into the false tradition. We want to stick with the truth. And that's what we need to do. Pre, pre tribulation rapture, King James Bible, blood atonement for salvation. Yeah. These are all important things. And uh, we need to stick with that because, uh, wow, so many people are turning away from the truth. It is so, so sad. So I never remembered that thing I was going to say, so I forgot. So maybe we'll have to have you back on sometime. <laughs> but um, I appreciate you coming on, Fabriel. Yeah. I appreciate you coming down to visit me soon. I look forward to that. We'll have some good times when you do. Amen. And, um, just so uh, you're bringing a friend too, right? Yeah, I'm bringing a friend. Okay. And um, maybe we can go street preaching or something, too. Amen. We'll oh, that would be awesome. I got some tracks. Uh, whoever you were, I forget. You sent me those tracks, Justified by His Blood. Thank you for those. I got those today. Finally. It took them a while to get here. But I've got those tracks. So that's that's a, a blessing. Um, so many things that people commented. Some good. It's funny. Some come because they want the truth. Some come just to attack and name call. Yeah. Uh, they left. So, amen. I amen. think they're all gone. It's sad that people will say, no, King James not the right Bible. It's like, yeah. you probably never studied it. Um, no, uh, you're wrong. You know, they say it's not a pre-trib rapture. Well, I mean, I be funny. It. like, let's say, you know, I'm not saying these people are lost or anything like that, but let's say they're lost and they, sh and then it's not funny, but you'll see what I mean. Basically, they show up in the great white throne judgment and you know, when the Bible says and the books were opened. I personally think, you know, wouldn't want to be something if the book that's open is the King James Bible. <laughs> that's well, the book. It's, it's books plural, so definitely that will be one of them. But uh, yeah. it will be other books too. But I'll yeah, um, every word. I think there's probably an angel writing down every word that everyone says. Basically, you know, yeah. People think that's far fetched. Well, I'm sitting here watching us on YouTube on our live stream. And every word is showing up in the closed caption. It's amazing. Yeah. So That's technology can do that. But uh, 
yeah so appreciate everyone for coming uh, thank you yeah. for watching hang in there we got some more sermons coming i'm just burning the candle at both ends so pray for me if i don't put a sermon out one sunday you'll know i just needed to rest but i do want to bring to you some people i have another person in mind to uh do a live stream with and uh he's a little uh, extreme <laughs> so i don't know if i'll do that with him i haven't asked him yet but he has some interesting things uh, he used to work for Pfizer, and I'd love for him to tell his testimony of why he can no longer work for that company and why he left. So pray about that. And, uh, it would be interesting. So um, that's about it. Uh, we talked about a lot of topics, and maybe we'll talk about some more next time. So I guess we'll stop there. You got anything else you want to add, Fabio? No, uh, that's pretty much it. Just stick with the King James Bible. Don't forsake it, man. That's it. Amen. Stick with the blood. Amen. Nothing but the blood. Nothing Amen. But the blood. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and I guess we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.